Shalom, everyone. My name is Noel Joshua Hadley, and I pull back curtains for a living. In fact, I never trust a conveniently hung drape. If questioning the official narrative is your thing, because let's face it, it's ridiculous, then you're in good company. Welcome to the Unexpected Cosmology. I know that mud flood research is oversaturated with the 1893 Chicago World Fair, and you're probably thinking, not this again. I'm actually dusting off an old paper from two years ago in order to breathe new life into it. And actually, with what I am about to present, I did not view any other YouTube channels or mud flood videos. I simply opened the books for myself. And I think you'll uh, find that what I'm about to present has some unique angles. I have a feeling that there are things being spoken about tonight that hasn't been revealed elsewhere. But again, I couldn't rightly say. I have put my whole self into the following report, and I'm hoping for an A-plus on the report card. It's nearly 80 pages, so we're going to get right to it tonight. Dave, are you uh, ready with the book drawing? Tonight we'll be giving away my very own book, uh, published rather recently with Sacred Word Publishing. It's called The Angel She Desired. And uh, it's one of those books where I look at a lot of extra biblical books and I piece them together and I learn some amazing things in the process. And we've been going over a lot of those um, the chapters from that book in these uh, these sessions. So, Dave, are we ready? Uh, I guess I'm not going to do video tonight, but um, winner is Mombard. Mombard. So hopefully you hear that. You can private uh, message me, and we can just get the the uh, address where you would like that shipped. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. So, everybody, I dropped the PDF file into the general voice chat, as I usually do. Hopefully everybody can scroll up a little bit, or maybe it's, um, uh, maybe it's featured for you guys. And let's delve straight into it. Tonight's paper is called The 1893 Chicago World Fair Was a Hoax by yours truly, Noel Joshua Hadley. I put this little quote in the front from a guy named Daniel Burnham. If you don't know who that is, that's okay, because you're going to get to know him tonight. He said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Part 1, Architects of Chilaga. Nearly two years ago, I wrote an article claiming that the 1893 Chicago World Fair was an orchestrated hoax. It is part of an international effort to erase the past. In so much that the neoclassical buildings employed for the Columbian Exposition were in fact the ancient and mythological Camelot city of Chilaga, rather than recently built. At the time, I was fighting against my inclinations to investigate the Millennial Kingdom of Messiah. Such a proposition was certainly in the back of my mind. It's just that the breadcrumbs simply hadn't led me there that far yet. Also, I wasn't quite ready to set all my eggs into one basket. And so, I settled upon the name attributed to Old World Maps, Chilaga. And nowadays, I'm not as trusting of old maps as I once was. Don't get me wrong, they do tell a story. But even the maps which happen to disagree with the ridiculous, ridiculous narrative that our corporate management shoveled down our throat may indeed still be drawn up as part of a psyop. We're all attempting to escape the matrix, but every maze has dead ends. Learning from our wrong turn, turns is our best policy. Contrarily, the purpose of this article is not to cover up an error or anything like that. Indeed, I am still convinced there was a city of Chilaga, hundreds or even thousands of years older than modern Chicago. Dozens of maps attest to its existence. Perhaps the city of Chilaga was an intended part of the narrative at one time, and Intel simply decided on a much-needed rewrite. It certainly wouldn't be the first time they flipped the script. That's, how I'm, that's why I am clapping away at a second draft, to help facilitate what has now become wholly evident in my mind. The 1893 Columbian Exposition may have been remnants of an ancient city, but it is not Chilaga which its architects were attempting to scrub. His story. That's what was being hidden. Chilaga was most likely one city among hundreds of others that were all a part of Messiah's millennial kingdom. 
The mud flood, as you will know by now, brought an end to the greater kingdom and doubled as the Great Reset. Whereas the last 200 or so years was the basic equivalent of bidding with a chronological liar. The World Fair in Chicago was nothing less than a re-education camp. The story of its construction begins with the United States government. Surprise? Probably not. Nearly every article that I can find greatly undermines that fact, though. Best to separate the old cognition from the picture of propaganda, I suppose. The Wikipedia beats around the bush, but in doing so, offers some rather juicy fruit for the plucking. Describing the fair organizers and financiers as many prominent civic, professional, and commercial leaders from around the United States sounds provocative. They even throw in railroad tycoon John Whitfield Bunn. You would expect the railroaders to be involved in a land grab cover-up such as this. But then he is described to us in his very own article as a personal friend of Mr. Lincoln. So there's that. Sometime in 1889, the government put out some feelers, and on July 22nd, Chicago City Council began their campaign to host the fair. The mayor of Chicago at the time, DeWitt Clinton Craigier, appointed a committee of 100 citizens to carry out his campaign and raise $5 million in stocks. And not just any citizens, mind you. Numbered among them was Lyman Gage who would go on to become Secretary of the Treasury for Presidents McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. Another member of Craigier's 100 Citizen Board was Andrew McNally. By this time, McNally had already co-founded Rand McNally, one of the largest and best-known map publishers in known history. But that's probably a coincidence. Other names include railroad tycoon George Pullman and J.P. Morgan assistant Charles Schwab. In Washington, petitions were considered from Chicago, St. Louis, New York, and Washington, D.C., which tells us they were already trying to figure out how to introduce people into the Millennial Kingdom cities, which finally made up future world fairs. Competition was fierce, too. In New York, J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and William Waldorf Astor, among others, pledged $15 million to finance the fair if Congress awarded it to New York. What do all three have in common? But that they're philanthropists. Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, gotta love your local philanthropist. The Vanderbilts specifically are no strangers to hoaxes. The Vanderbilt child custody trial demonstrates that fact, and I put a link there um, I wrote on that story. And who was a Vanderbilt again, but our very own CNN journalist, Anderson Cooper. Here we see in Wikipedia, what finally persuaded Congress was Chicago banker Lyman Gage, who raised several million additional dollars in a 24-hour period, over and above New York's final offer. Months of deliberation in the House then culminated with Chicago's victory on February 24, 1890, but only after Chicago banker Lyman Gage raised several million additional dollars in a 24-hour period over and above New York's final offer. Um, okay. Apparently, the government only thinks in these. You know, cash, 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 cash. But you knew that already. Moving on. Awarding Chicago came with a catch. Craigier's 100 citizen band was required to raise an additional $5 million. We are then told that the cost of raising the temporary city surmounted to a price tag of $27 million. That's a lot of dough. Inflation in 2021 is 30.54% higher than it was in 1890, giving us a price tag of $824,580,000 if the same fare were attempted today. Whose pockets were affected by that funnel of cash, I wonder? The lot then fell to Burnham and Root, a successful Chicago-based architectural firm whose fingerprints included many of the familiar skyscrapers which had arisen after the 1871 fire. By the way, I, I wish I had time in here to talk about Mrs. O'Leary's cow because that's, that's a whole nother scandalous hoax right there. Take a mental note of that. The fire. 
Chicago was not the only World's Fair location chosen by the House after succumbing to a citywide destruction. But more on that later. The two founding members of the firm, as the title suggests, was Daniel H. Burnham and John W. Root. I checked. They're both spooks. Royal spooks. And it only makes sense that they would be. I mean, if a Millennial Kingdom city were to be handed off to any two individuals who were to receive credit for raising it from swamp water, you, then you might as well expect their pedigree to line up with the children of Cain. Well, they most certainly do. They're related to everyone, including each other. Burnham and Root are sixth cousins via somebody named William Weeks. One is far more royal than the other, though. Let's start with John W. Root. Follow along. There's actually a link here to the, one of the genealogy sites I use, which is amazing. He's related to many of our favorites, including J.P. Morgan, Assassin's Mark David Chapman, and John Hickley Jr., our kissing cousins. Isn't that interesting? But so are the Wilson brothers, a.k.a. the Beach Boys, as well as the Wright brothers and Amy Grant, everyone's favorite Christian singer. She is super, uh, <laughs> super royal, by the way, and she's also related to the Salem witches. That list goes on, but let's get to the United States presidents uh, and John W. Root's family tree. I was only able to track down several of them, six in all. That's the same thing as saying not a lot, which tells us that I've started with the lesser of the two. James Garfield is a third cousin via Jotham Carpenter, but then we have Ruther B. Hayes, Calvin Coolidge, Franklin D. Roosevelt, George H. W. Bush, and George W. Bush. What spook isn't related to the Bushes? United States vice presidents include uh, Levi Parsons, Morton, and Charles Dawes. We also find first ladies Nancy Reagan, Edith Roosevelt, Alice Roosevelt, and Bass Truman in his ranks. Only one direct descendant of his came over on the Mayflower, and I'm always looking for that. Um, specifically who came over on the Mayflower. That would be his sixth great-grandfather, John Billington. And from there, his trail grows cold, the fire fizzles. Root undoubtedly had blue blood, but it was so muddy down that he was expendable. You shall see what I mean by that in a few minutes. Continuing now with the royal roots of Daniel H. Burnham. If genealogies are your thing, then you shan't be disappointed. Follow along. Three Mayflower passengers make up Burnham's patriarchs, which is already more promising. John Alden and William Bradford were his sixth great-grandfathers, with Thomas Rogers following as a seventh passenger. Uh, Richard Moore is a cousin, uh, also a Mayflower passenger. I found no Magna Carta surties in Root's line, but with Burnham, it's different. John DeLacy, Gilbert DeClaire, Robert Fitzwalter, Sayher uh, de Quincy, and Robert de Vere are all 18th great-grandfathers. Richard DeClaire is his 19th great-grandfather. Hugh, uh, Hugh Le Bygod is a 20th great-grandfather, with Roger Le Bygod filling in as the 21st. If you were counting, that's eight in all. He's no Marilyn Monroe, but still impressive. Numbered among uh, his patriarchal line are four other Magna Carte surties, filling in the rank of cousins. William D. Obney, William D. Huntingfield, William D. Uh, Landvillet, and John Fitz Robert. A lot of Williams in there. From Plymouth Rock, we can trace the same line of kings. Uh, King Henry III of England, his 19th great-grandfather. William the Conqueror of England, 22nd great-grandfather. King Robert I of France, 27th great-grandfather. Uh, Alf Alfred the Great, King of the Anglo-Saxons, 29th great-grandfather. And last but certainly not least, Charlemagne, King of the Franks, 32nd great-grandfather. Though only a cousin, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, is an eighth cousin ten times removed via Isabella de uh, Beauchamp, and worth mentioning. Two close kin worth noting are Mary Perkins Bradbury, uh, fifth great-grandfather via John Perkins, and Captain John Alden, fifth great-granduncle via John Alden. By the way, guys, I didn't mention it here, but that Bradbury and Mary Bradbury, uh, a direct descendant is Ray Bradbury. All right. Bradbury was convicted of Salem uh, witchcraft in 1692, whereas Alden was simply accused. Being indirectly related means Burnham is no Walt Disney or Lucille Ball, but they're nonetheless related, and it's still impressive. Reverend George Burroughs was executed for witchcraft at Salem, and the two are cousins. U.S. presidents for cousins include the following, George Washington, John Adams, 
Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, John Quincy Adams, Millard Fillmore, Ruther B. Hayes, James Garfield, Calvin Coolidge, Franklin D. Roosevelt, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. There are, of course, Declaration of Independence and U.S. Constitution signers as well as governors included in his family tree, but they don't need mentioning. Among his notorious list of names for relatives, we find old favorites like Alan uh, Dulles, Noah Webster, Increase Sumner, Ken Burns, Hugh Hefner, Julia Child, Norman Rockwell, Charles Darwin, Francis Scott Key, General Robert E. Lee, Meriwether Lewis, Helen Keller, and the Rockefellers. They're all canes and play a part in the deception. Now that we have established the royal pedigree of Burnham and Root, we can commence with the 1893 Columbian Exposition. But even before the fairgrounds could get up and off the ground, the Wikipedia lets us in on the news of Root's sudden passing. It says this, both the building's primary designer, John Wilborn Root, and the Mason's primary representative, Norman Gazette, died of natural causes during its construction. It says he died of natural causes during its construction, but that can't possibly be accurate. You shall see why I've come to that conclusion in a moment. And I, I probably should have mentioned here, I think this was cut, uh, I cut a little passage out, that while they were designing the World Fair, the 1893 Chicago, Chicago World Fair, Burnham and Root just so happened to be building the Freemason building in Chicago. Like, surprise, surprise. He was born on January 10th, 1850, and died on January 15th, 1891, making him 41 years old at the time. What sort of natural cause might off a well-to-do 41-year-old? Perhaps that's the wrong question to ask, as we might better be uh, served in asking why. Well, let's keep reading. Burnham and Root had accepted responsibility to oversee the design and construction of the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, uh, then desolate Jackson Park on the South Lakefront. The largest world fair to the, that date, 1893, it celebrated the 400-year anniversary of Christopher Columbus's famous voyage. After Root's sudden and unexpected death, wink, wink, a team of Distinguished American architects and landscape architects, including Burnham, Frederick Law Olmsted, Charles McKim, Richard M. Hunt, George P. Post, Henry Van Brunt, and Louis uh, Sullivan, radically changed Root's modern and colorful style to a classical revival style. Hmm. To ensure the project's success, Burnham moved his personal residence into a wooden headquarters called the Shanty on the burgeoning fairgrounds to improve his ability to oversee construction. The construction of the fair faced huge financial, financial and logical hurdles, including a worldwide financial panic and an extremely tight time frame to open on time. You see, it's all in the wording. Root's death created a very different scenario, which just so happened to be the intended outcome. The word used here is radically. Time and again, we read how John Wilborn Root was the creative genius of the partnership, while Daniel H. Burnham had the organization and pers personal flair to make the venture a success. And so, when it came to the Chicago World Fair, Root was aiming for a modern and colorful style, which is nice and all, but a problem if the buildings already existed, and even more so if they had already been built centuries earlier in the classical revival style. Therefore, Root's sudden and unexpected death allowed his business partner and several other architects to radically change the agenda, but only in such a way that they were back on track again. Dig around a little, and the emphasis surrounding his death changes, depending upon its angle. For example, Root was overseeing the construction of the Masonic Temple building, which we already explained, at the time of his unfortunate bout with pneumonia. Looks like the Mason's primary representative died too. Bummer. But just so you don't suspect anything, it says right here that they both died of quote-unquote natural causes. The building, which measured 21 stories and 302 feet, featured a central court ringed by nine floors of shops with offices above and, you'll love this, meeting rooms for the Masons at the very top. Sounds like a neat building to live in, wouldn't you agree? Opening in 1892, the Masonic Temple was the tallest structure of its time. Its life was short-lived, though. The Masonic Temple was torn down in 1939. That's a lifespan of only 42 years. Only one more than Root's short life. The Masons must have grown bored during those penthouse meetings with all that money they've got to throw around. 
There were, of course, several architects involved beyond Burnham and Root. Frederick Law Olmsted is the guy who designed Central Park in New York. The fact that we constantly hear how unnatural he cultivated it in carving up the land is just another clever way of masking the fact that New York was already a city long before the mud flood. We can include Central Park in that. They were all in on it. I'm willing to, I'm willing to bet Olmsted's uh, specialty was transformation, turning the old into something which the New World Order might appreciate. We read this. The expedition's office set up shop in the upper floors of the Rand McNally building on Adams Street, the f- world's first all-steel-framed skyscraper. Davis's team organized the exhibits with the help of G. Brown Good of the Smithsonian. The Midway was inspired by the 1889 Paris Universal Exposition, which included um, uh, ethnological villages. One more noteworthy observation. The exposition's offices set up shop in the upper floors of the Rand McNally building. The building was designed by Burnham and Root. But then notice how we're back upon the map makers again. Rand McNally co-founded, a co-founder, William H. Rand, arrived in California in 1849. Only makes sense that he would, seeing as how the gold rush was a hoax, backed by Masons and Mormons, intended to manufacture a manifest destiny narrative, but only to carefully control westward expansionism. Rand co-founded the state's first newspaper, the Los Angeles Star. So, a media man, was he? Another name drop includes G. Brown Good of the Smithsonian, Propaganda Central. When it came to scrubbing his story from the land, Intel wasn't cutting any corners, were they? The exposition was a spare-no-expense affair. Part 2, The White City Understand what I'm ultimately getting at when it comes to the World Fair architects. There are few blueprints to be found, if any, and documentation is thin. You'd think the boys sitting around smoking stogies in the penthouse of the Rand McNally building would have drawn up some plans for their big budget, but no. Or that Lyman Gage would have asked to see the art sketches for all that money he happened to pocket in one day, especially after they ditched Root's suggestions for a modern and colorful style in favor of a neoclassical city of old. I suppose the construction workers expected to raise 200 new buildings on 600 acres of reclaimed swamp all of which had come to fruition within two years of its initial planning, were experts on how to build an ancient metropolis like that, and in so little time. That's probably it. Meanwhile, as best as I can tell, the architects sat around blowing rings of smoke to remind themselves of the incoming zeros. And then we read this. The Expedition Corporation and National Exposition Commission settled on Jackson Park, and an area around it as their site, their fair site, Daniel H. Burnham was selected as Director of Works and George R. Davis as Director General. Burnham emphasized architecture and sculpture as central to the fair and assembled the period's top talent to design the buildings and grounds, including Frederick Law Olmsted for the grounds. The temporary buildings were designed in an ornate, ornate neoclassical style and painted white, resulting in the fair site being referred to as the White City. I'm going to pause here for a drink. The official story has the 1893 Columbian Exposition built akin to a movie set. You know, don't walk off the stage or you'll trip over a bucket and fall into the rafters. That's how Burnham and friends were capable of raising an entire city in in as little as two to three years, apparently. Because some 27 million people, a number equal to half of the United States population at the time, left the farm and braved the frontier to view a movie set built of glue and popsicle sticks. Ridiculous. The Wikipedia greatly undermines the purported materials used as well. They simply tell us the buildings were of the neoclassical style, but temporary, and that they were painted white. That's not the whole story, though. It is only elsewhere that we read how. Facades were made not of stone, but a mixture of plaster, cements, and a jute fiber called staff. Try to understand what they're ultimately attempting to convince us of when speaking of a neoclassical city and then calling it temporary. Neoclassical architecture is defined for us in the following way. Again, according to Wikipedia, Neoclassical architecture is an architectural style produced by the neoclassical movement that began in the mid-18th century in Italy and France. It became one of the most prominent 
I just noticed that. It's so interesting that it started in Italy again. We talked about that last week. It became one of the most prominent architectural styles in the Western world. The prevailing styles of architecture in most of Europe for the previous two centuries, Renaissance architecture and Baroque architecture, already represented partial revivals of the classical architecture of ancient Rome and, much less, ancient Greek architecture. But the neoclassical movement aimed to strip away the excessive excesses of late Baroque and return to a purer and more authentic classical style adapted to modern purposes. Neoclassical simply refers to the number of buildings scattered across this flat, motionless plain, which are purported to have been constructed in the 1800s rather than any other time period, despite looking as a classical Greek or Roman building would. That's sim simply the slave, master slave plantation owner's way of rearranging the geological columns in his story, and we all fell for it. If a historical building looks classical, then I'm willing to bet it was classical. We are told of all the 19th century architects who built them by horse cart and pickaxe. Um, well then, why didn't they keep constructing more of them? Beautiful buildings, eh? Especially once the power drill came along. Probably because they'd already assigned all the classical buildings to the architects who were appointed to design them. Wink, wink. There were no more ancient places left to build because they'd never raised them to begin with. When it comes to the neoclassical buildings of Chilaga, however, our historical storytellers do manage to get one thing right. The entire city was painted white. In this way, the entire city shimmered in the sun. It's why the Chicago World Fair is still being advertised to us today as the White City. I almost forgot to mention that part. Globs of paint were an addition, which I can only assume the Kingdom Saints did not contribute to. The paint, you see, was the sleight of hand, intended to create the illusion of something temporary. Even more so, globs and globs of paint would have helped to de-age the city. But I'm not buying the lies that come with that admission price. There are other additions as well beyond the paint. The trained eye will no doubt notice the big fat phallus, center stage, rising into the skyline, and will undoubtedly be drawn to it right away. That's a definite addition to the fairgrounds and one of the oldest rules of war. Whenever you ransack a city and claim it as your own, tear down the opposing gods, but be sure to erect your own. An obelisk, as you will know by now, is a penis, and a Freemason's way of raising a flag while remaining in the closet. Now, I just want to point out here that I know a lot of mud flutters are trying are reinventing the obelisk. I really do believe that they planted those everywhere post mud flood. I do not believe that's a Millennial Kingdom thing. Anyhow, there she is, Burnham's white city in all her glory. Impressive, no? 200 newly designed buildings, mostly of the neoclassical nature, and on 600 acres of reclaimed swamps, meant workers had to haul ass to get the city built in as, again, in as little as two years. Look at her intricate and ornate decorations. Very little, if anything, is repeated. They tell us that's all temporary building materials, though plaster, cement, and staff. If the city was built of a cheap temporary plaster and the official narrative insists as much, then it would, ha then it, it would have deteriorated and crumbled at the first rainstorm. Nothing would have been safe for the pedestrian. Oh sure, you could convince millions of people that Chilaga was built of temporary material, but what fool of an architect and construction foreman would waste indoor plaster on the outside of a building? How are any of these buildings structurally sound? Check out the size of those pillars and the massive archway in the background. Is that a dome I see? Row upon row of arches and pillars, spiraling towers and cake toppers on top of those towers. They're all chalk in a rainstorm. Meanwhile, people were climbing to the top of one building or another, built of plaster and, and chaff, daring certain death for a better view of the city, I suppose, certainly not for the faint of heart. I suppose they stepped carefully on the rafter boards, or else somebody might have fallen through. Looks reinforced to me, concrete even, but I'm not the one telling this story. Look, we could all argue all day about what the city was made of. That's not temporary. They don't call it the Windy City for nothing. 
Have you ever experienced the frigid air that blows off Lake Michigan on a crisp spring morning? The thing about movie sets is that they blow over. A lot of people don't know this, but the origin of Chicago's nickname may not originate with the wind. There is another popular theory which holds that it was coined in reference to Chicago's ranting politicians who were deemed to be full of hot air. Now, that is an origin story which I can agree to. So much hot air being blown our way. Getting back to that dome, I checked. At no other time in Burnham's career did he design a dome. And why not? Usually, when an architect like Michelangelo or Bruno Lischi designs a dome, they do so for the amazement of gawkers for generations to come. But not so with Burnham. Burnham is not like the others. He designed buildings intended to be supported by temporary materials and which resembled no other structures raised during his illustrious career. Amazing. Never again did the city of Chicago request another dome, at least not from Burnham. Burnham really knew how to pull one out of the hat. The Palace of Fine Arts was designed but also assigned by Burnham as the ex exhibition's only permanent structure. It still stands today and serves as Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry. If only buildings could talk. Tell me again how the palace looks any more temporary or less permanent than any other neoclassical structure at the Columbian Exposition. A decision was apparently made over stogies in the penthouse of Rand McNally to reinforce the Palace of Fine Arts with concrete, whereas the neoclassical marvels molded from plaster would have to brave the elements. Did I get that right? Their sense of foresight is impeccable, as it just so happened to survive the fire, whereas no other building's dead. But that's probably just a coincidence. If only I could wander those ha hallways, lost in the artistry. Call me a broken record, but nothing about the inside of those buildings speaks temporary. Just look at the size of those pillars. They're giants among men. Contracting construction workers for framework and drywall is one thing, but then hounding down the craftsmen necessary for the arches and finer embroideries? Give me a break. The drawing boards needed to conceptualize the hundreds of unique possibilities, all before the committee could decide on each one and flesh them out, doesn't come close to matching up with the provided names and required man hours. The only architect present who remotely comes across like a Disney Imagineer is Frederick Law Olmsted, and he was a landscape artist. Is it just me, or is that guy standing under the shadow of the pillar texting? Seems a little out of place, don't you think? Wouldn't surprise me, though. Seriously, it would be difficult to surprise me of anything anymore. He looks preoccupied, texting, bored even. Perhaps the photo is purposeful, and he is simply posing as a model of humanity. For all I know, somebody has just explained to him that he's standing under the shadow of the Millennial Kingdom, but he'd rather show off the plate of pasta he had for lunch on social media. Here we even... Here we are even shown a worker applying finishing touches on the, machin the machinery building. Unbelievable. That's a work of art. Who is the artist and can I have his autograph? Shame that nobody knows about him. It's a complex design for the industrialization of machinery, mind you, as if that doesn't scream repurposed building. Those doorways should have been moved to the uh, Louvre in Paris. And if they wouldn't have it, I'm in the, in the market for millennial doorways. I totally walk in and out through one of those. And then we find structures like this. It's certainly very elegant from a frontier perspective, but American all the same. Obviously built. Not the creation of Burnham, though. The Idaho building was designed by Kirkland Cutter. And where have we heard that name before? The Royal House of Hastings has been the topic of one of my past papers. And Kirkland Cutter is one of them. The Hastings family has long attributed their name to psyops and hoaxes, one of which includes Lansford Hastings. Not surprising, since their line goes all the way back to the first Earl of Huntington. Lansford Hastings, if you recall, made a name for himself giving crappy roadside directions to the Donner Party. Dorothea Dix and the Limburgs derive from the House of Hastings, among countless others, but so does Reed Hastings, co-founder and CEO of Netflix. 
I could go on and on about the Hastings, but I won't. I simply wanted to point out that I found two architects in the Hastings family and wasn't disappointed. Thomas Hastings designed the Tower of Jewels and Fountain of Energy for the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. Far more impressive than Kirkland Cutter's work, but more on that some other time. The Columbian Exposition did involve one female architect. Sophia Hayden was only 21 years of age when she designed that thing. It was her first project, too. An 80,000 square foot, two story structure called the Women's Building. Noise. As a recent graduate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Hayden apparently didn't mind that her grand design would be molded by wood and plaster and then destroyed two years later. The mere fact that Congress specifically funneled money into an all women's building run by women and aimed at Pushing women's rights onto the public consciousness reminds us once again that the suffragettes were uh, the suffragettes were not. I'm sorry, I just lost my I just lost my uh, place there. The suffragettes were not an organic movement of the people; they were of the government. World Fair presenters included Susan B. Anthony, Florence Kelly, and Julia Ward Howe. And guess what? They're all spooks. There has never been a time in post-mudflood society when Intel did not hack away and toy with the image of Yahuwah as represented by men and women. Being proud of their work should be obvious to my serial reader by now, but you never really know as some people hold on to things. This is what the inside of the women's building looked like. Its ceiling is glass. So many intricate and ornate designs for something so temporary. More like a repurposed building, if you ask me. But again. I'm not the one telling the story. The Freemasons are. And here we see a colored reprint of the entrance to the woman's building. The trim and molding alone is awe-inspiring. Looks like a Renaissance graffitius showed up with his chisel again. Unbelievable. Quick correction. Perhaps Florence Kelly was legitimate after all. Difficult to tell, though. It happens all the time, even now. Good girls or boys end up in the wrong crowd, surrounded by spooks, thinking their friends are legitimate. We'll give her a free pass. Sophia Hayden, though, seems like a bit of a loose goose if I say so myself. The woman's building would be her only project. Hayden simply appeared and then disappeared from the world stage. Gone. Ended up marrying a starving artist or something. The Wikipedia describes her removal from the world stage as follows. During construction, Hayden's design principles were compromised by incessant changes demanded by the construction committee. Oh dear. Spearheaded by socialite Bertha Palmer, dun dun dun, who eventually fired Hayden from the project. Hayden appeared at the inaugural celebration and had published accounts of support by her fellow architects. Sophia Hayden was fired for meddling too much into her own building project. Well, I'll be. Never saw that coming. The woman who disposed of her was Bertha Palmer. She had married into money some twenty decade, uh, some two. I'm sorry, some two decades earlier to Potter Palmer, a Chicagoan real estate tycoon, and is therefore described to us as an American businesswoman, socialite, and philanthropist. Gotta love your philanthropist. Consider. What's really happening here? Secret societies are involved in secretive matters, as you well know. Bertha Palmer, the philanthropist, dearest of Chicago, was one of them, whereas Sophia Hayden was invited into the inner circle. I'm willing to bet she didn't make the cut. Either Sophia Hayden wasn't yet initiated, or she hadn't been initiated for long. Elsewhere, the wiki does add this little tidbit. However, when Hayden wouldn't take Palmer's advice to accept rich women's donations of architectural odds and ends to decorate the exterior, fearing a horrible visual impact as a result, Palmer fired Hayden and hired the much more malleable Candace Wheeler to supervise the interior decoration. Wasn't much for gifts from the wealthy, hmm? Or perhaps the building itself had got into Hayden's head Thing is how she was assigned the task of being its designer and all. At least she didn't come down with pneumonia. Encyclopedia.com portrays Sophia Hayden's downfall in a slightly different light and reads, Sophia Hayden, um, Sophia Hayden had a nervous breakdown. Oh, sure she did. Oh, hold on. That's, 
Uh, okay, let's read this here. Let's get a little mix up. For the next two years, Hayden traveled back and forth to Chicago, preparing working drawings for the building, the demands of the project, which often included placating the demanding board of lady managers, took their physical and mental toll on Hayden. Following the informal dedication of the women's building in October 1892, she suffered a nervous breakdown and was unable to attend the fair, which opened in May of 1893. Hayden never practiced architecture as she had planned. In 1894, she designed a memorial building for the Women's Clubs of America, but it was never constructed. She later married artist William Bennett, and her name slipped into obscurity. When she died in 1953, her obituary did not even note her accomplishment. Ouch. Sophia Hayden had a nervous breakdown. Oh, sure she did. I'm willing to bet the women's club spread that rumor. She was unable to attend the fair at its opening in 1893. You know, because of her firing. Meanwhile, she was still capable of designing a memorial building for the women's clubs of America in 1894. That's just like the very ambitious Sophia Hayden that I know, still charging ahead, hoping to get buildings erected for other women. It wasn't constructed, though, and I think I know why. She had already been given the opportunity to play the game and make a name for herself. But alas, Sophia Hayden wasn't exactly the jump-through-the-hoops type. That's not secret society material, if you ask me. Better yet, ask Bertha. Um, uh, she can be seen... Man, I had a little misprint there. Better yet, ask Bertha. She can be seen flaunting her affluence and money in her latest princess dress in an 1893 painting, Mrs. Potter Palmer. There she is, the year of the firing, or the year of the carnival opening. I think I have a few more um, uh, misprints in this than usual because this is hot off the press and I didn't have time to go over it again. Part three, the Wizard of Menlo Park slash Oz and the Emerald City. On May 1st, 1893, President Grover Cleveland gave the opening speech to an audience numbering nearly three quarters of a million people. It's a lot of people. And then as the choir burst into the Hallelujah Chorus, he pressed the button which lit the fair. Ridiculous. Using Handel to introduce electricity in a Millennial Kingdom city is about as Orwellian a tactic as they come. In one stunning moment, something like 100,000 um, lamps illuminated the future of humanity and further enslaved them. That's doublespeak right there. Apparently, the Butson performed many other useful deeds, depending on what website you read. By some accounts, the 2,000-horsepower steam engine roared to life in machi machinery hall, while others insist flags were unfurled. Standing in the crowd was theosophist and children's author L. Frank Baum, but we'll get to him in a moment. Because there's the table, draped with the flag, and the button that started it all. Kind of looks like a z ziggurat, d don't it? You may not see how that connects with the City of Lights, but I do. Perhaps we'll make those connections in a little while. Even more stunning than the primitive mashing button is the intricate design of the white city beyond the crowd. Even the skeptic should be given pause at such a sight, as not even Disney was capable of building something so grand. If only buildings could talk. It may have occurred to you that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, according to our writers of history, and that his 400th anniversary indoctrination affair arrived one, tier, one year too late. I was curious about the reasons why, too. Common sense might dictate that they were incapable of building an entire city and stocking its shelves in time. It's the excuse I assumed they were making at first. But after closer inspection, that's not what we're told. Dedication ceremonies were in fact held on October 21st, 1892, which means the city had already been built. The public, however, would not be allowed in until the following summer. Say what? If these buildings were in fact thrown together with temporary material, staff visit, decay would have been imminent, particularly on the outer edges. You would think time would be of the essence. Get the people in there and sell tickets. Make a buck or two. Move, move. Why was the fair delayed for seven entire months then? We are told because of the 1892 presidential election. 
That's why. Sure, let's go with that, because everybody's vote matters, as you know. I'm sure even the weather respected that decision. Managing a closer look at the buildings directly behind President Cleveland, I'm still trying to figure out how exactly any of those buildings are temporary. I'm seeing solid brick and a ledge, and those windows don't come cheap. That may be a stage, but it's most definitely not a movie set. I don't want to push our conversation into racist territory, but knowing how slow white people dig ditches and seeing as how no Mexicans were present, I'm going with the timeline which suggests it took Irish immigrants the bulk of those two years simply attempting to figure out how to hotwire the city and make Cleveland's neat little mashing button work. Of course, if that didn't work, having an employee flip a switch in each individual building and on cue would most certainly do the trick. Don't ask me why, but L. Frank Baum had a thing for his hand on the chin. So many poses to choose from. Perhaps a hand tucked into his sleeve would have been a little too obvious, and he was going out of his way to promote no funny business. Kind of like that regurgitated story about how he kept shopping the Oz book around and nobody in the publishing world would print it. Though I do admit to having purchased my very own copy, I don't buy the narrative they're selling especially since your ordinary everyday genealogical search will show that Baum was a royal and related to all the others. There were spooks in Cleveland's crowd, and Baum was one of them. Rumor has it that theosophist Elfrey Baum was so inspired by the Chicago World's Fair that he based his Emerald City upon it. Kind of makes you wonder. Better yet, let's dispense with the rumors because the boys down at PBS have already connected the dots and told us that's exactly what happened. Here's a quote from American Experience. While Baum was still on the Evening Post staff, however, the paper ran a tantalizing story about a wizard, Thomas Edison, the Wizard of Menlo Park, known for the astounding creations emerging from his research lab, which was originally located in Menlo Park, New Jersey. There you have it. Baum was a newspaper man. Plant a red flag on that one. Just so we're clear, the Evening Post was a native publication of Chicago. Baum had secured a job with the paper in January of that year, 1891. He had moved his family there from the Dakota Territories, and some have claimed it was in anticipation of the exposition. The boys down at PBS would have us think the paper simply fell upon his desk and that the article inspired him. That's neat and all, but the media was pushing out a script a media which Baum was a part of, and in turn, the children's author would play his part in advancing the narrative. The person who would collaborate with Baum in a few short years just so happened to be another newspaper man. W. W. Dinslow left his post in San Francisco to document the Chicago World Fair for local newspapers, visiting it frequently. By the way, the W. W. in his name is for William Wallace, the prize fighter from the Highlands. William Wallace Dinslow. Gee, I wonder if they're related. Fun fact, the royalties received from the prints and stage versions of Oz able Denslow to purchase an island in Bermuda, where he promptly crowned himself King Denslow I. Good times. Tell me, though, that the Emerald City doesn't resemble the White City of Chicago. You can't, because they're nearly identical. You will tell me that they're not the same because the World Fair was only painted white, whereas the Emerald City was made of emeralds or whatever. Aha, then! That is where you are wrong. The Emerald title was just as much of a deception as the white in the city near Chicago. Baum was in the know. On a great many things, as was Denslow. And as the keeper of secrets, we are dispensed with a titillating truth in chapter 15 of their book. Follow along. So this is a conversation between the great and mighty powerful Wizard of Oz and Dorothy. And the wizard says, just to amuse myself and keep the good people busy, I ordered them to build a city. <laughs> Ouch. And my palace. And they did it all willingly and well. Then I thought, as the country was so green and beautiful, I would call it the Emerald City. And to make the name fit better, I put green spectacles on all the people so that everything they saw was green. And then Dorothy says, but isn't everything here green? 
And the wizard says, No more than in, in any other city, replied Oz. But when you wear green spectacles, why, of course, everything you see looks green to you. The Emerald City was built a great many years ago, for I was a young man when the balloon brought me here, and I am a very old man now. But my people have worn green glasses on their eyes so long that most of them think it really is an Emerald City. And it certainly is a beautiful place, abounding in jewels and precious metals, and every good thing that is needed to make one happy. I have been good to the people, and they like me. But ever since this palace was built, I have shut myself up and would not see any of them. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, Chapter 15. Well, that settles it then, straight from the gravitating big head's mouth. The Emerald City was never actually green to begin with. The wizard simply convinced everyone to wear green spectacles, you see. It was all an illusion. Men and munchkin alike were happy to be fooled, as usual. Best to not pull back too many curtains. And while we're at it, keep wearing those spectacles, or else the entire operation might be foiled. If you're slow at metaphors, then I'll try my best to spell this out for you. The emerald glasses were instruments of deception and are comparable to the globs of paint which hid the white city from its true self. All right, and then I'm going to just skip down here. Anyways, the, the, the wizard lied to everyone. I'm going to skip that paragraph. This. Never mind that. Continuing. And this is continuing the conversation from um, Dorothy and the wizard. I think you are a very bad man, said Dorothy. Oh, no, my dear. I'm really a very good man, but I'm a very bad wizard, I must admit. Cough, innocent, cough. Sorry I had something in my th throat. Only a Freemason would think like that. Only a Freemason would admittedly play the part of a wizard who pulls the wool over the eyes of everyone, but then attempts to sell you on his moral compass. Reading on. Can't you give me brains? asked the Scarecrow. You don't need them. You are learning something every day. A baby has brains, but it doesn't know much. Experience is the only thing that brings knowledge. And the longer you are on Earth, the more experience you are sure to get. Pause. Perhaps there is a lesson to be learned in all of this. And believe it or not, the wizard is the one who is telling the truth. Indeed, we all have brains, and as such, we are learning something every day. I have learned much since the time I was lied to as a baby, and so I have been on the earth long enough to realize their entire narrative is a sham. We are being lied to about everything. Everybody has a brain. Unfortunately, not everybody chooses to use them. Continuing, that may be all true, said the Scarecrow, but I shall be very unhappy unless you give me brains. The false wizard looked at him carefully. I wish I could tell you the Scarecrow learned his lesson, but he refused to admit he'd been lied to, even in the face of it. Just goes to show that, given the preference, people choose to be fooled. Bummer. The Emerald City wasn't going to be exposed anytime soon. All the rest of us can do is let everyone think we're crazy and uh, do to die of blindness at any given moment for refusing to live in fear or wear the corrective lenses they're handing out. Part 4. Chicago, the first amusement park. Pause for a drink of coffee. I think we're about, we're about halfway through this. We'll get through this. In as little as six months, the Columbian expedition introduced Americans to moving sidewalks, uh, uh, phosphorescent lamps, Cracker Jack, um, that's a Mandela effect, by the way, juicy fruit gum, Quaker oats, cream of wheat, shredded wheat, the hamburger, a suggestive billy dance known as the Hoochie Coochie, and the Ferris wheel. I'm still kicking myself for having been born a century too late and therefore missing out on this one. But visitors were finally able to meet Aunt Jemima in person. There is so much ground to cover, and I am pained coming to terms with the fact that I shan't be capable of gleaning the entire harvest. Not in the second incarnation of this article, at least. Frederick Douglass, uh, his part in Chilaga, was on my stack of talking points. But alas, I've run out of time. In short, though, racial division has long been a favorite tactic of intel, and Douglass was their man. Helen Killer and Buffalo Bill Cody are two others in that stack. What happened is I started taking notes on each of them and began to find that they deserve spin-off articles of their own. Lastly, and this really stabs my heart, 
we shan't be discussing Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla in any capacity. That will shock most of you, seeing as how free energy was a millennial kingdom pastime and the Chicago welfare initiated everyone into an inverted reality. This all comes down to how I budgeted my time. You shall have to wait for the third incarnation of this article. In short, though, they were both spooks. And really, everyone, you know, has spent so much time talking about Edison and Tesla. I kind of, I wanted to talk about things that maybe people weren't talking about. Among Chicago's many firsts was a land solely devoted to rides and other attractions. We are told the amusement area was developed by somebody named Soul Bloom and that he was a young music promoter. Sounds legit. The Wikipedia was kind enough to leave us a link just in case anybody wanted to discover more about the small-time promoter with the opportunity of a lifetime. I took the bait, and this is what I learned. Soul Bloom was a songwriter and American politician from New York who began his career as an entertainment um, impresario and sheet music publisher in Chicago. He served 14 terms in the United States House of Representatives from the west side of Manhattan from 1923 until his death in 1949. His wiki wiki bio evolves from a songwriter to American politician in a single sentence, as if that's not suspicious. We then learn, same sentence, that he started his career in Chicago before moving on to New York. Moving on up, I guess. The second sentence is a doozy. He served 14 terms in the United States House of Representatives from the west side of Manhattan from 1923 until his death in 1949. If you thought that was bad, wait until they lead us into the third sentence in which we read, Bloom was the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee from 1939 to 1947, and again in 1949 during a critical period of American foreign policy. In the run-up to World War II, he took charge of high-priority foreign policy legislations for the Roosevelt administration, including authorization for Lend-Lease in 1940. 1940. He oversaw congressional approval of the United Nations and of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, or the UNRRA, which worked to assist millions of displaced people in Europe. He was a member of the American delegation at the creation of the United Nations in San Francisco in 1945 and at the Rio Conference of 1947. In the final years leading up to the war, Bloom entered the foreign policy game, becoming the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee for the Roosevelt administration between 1939 and 1947. This all culminated in becoming a member of the American delegation of the creation of the United Nations in San Francisco in 1945. Man, this guy's a hot mess. It says he also oversaw congressional approval of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, helping to assist millions of displaced people in Europe. Wait, displaced people in Europe? Are they talking about the Jews again? I'm pretty sure this is a Zionist thing. Perhaps we need to keep on reading just to be certain. Next paragraph. And it says right there, he adopted, in blue, he adopted the Zionist position that mandated Palestine should become the refugee uh, refuge for Jewish victims of the Holocaust. I knew it. Bloom was a Zionist and a perpetrator of the Holocaust hoax. I didn't want to speak too soon, but there it is. If anybody knew about the indoctrinating indoctrinating power of propaganda, it was the World Fair's amusements organizer. Never mind that, though. We're all supposed to celebrate his organic origins as a young music promoter. It's so exciting, knowing his humble origins and all. I'm happy for him. He went from convinced, uh, converting a recently abandoned Millennial Kingdom city, well, call it Chilaga, into something which the Sons of Cain could be happy with, to transforming the United Nations-sponsored land of Israel, specifically the Holocaust victims who were granted the keys of their newfound kingdom, into our public consciousness. I'm sensing a progression, but that's probably none of my business. You don't have to go far to find out uh, Bloom's musical promotional skills, either. America was first introduced to a Billy dancer known as Little Egypt at the Chicago World Fair. Well, technically, uh, if I can pronounce her name right, uh, Farida Mazar uh, Spiropoulos, that, that last part is Greek, who also performed under the stage name Fatima, a name which means abstain, meaning chaste or motherly. Are you not entertained? got her start at the Bird Cage Theater in Tombstone, Arizona. Oh, say it ain't so. 
Tombstone, Arizona. But not just Tombstone. The Birdcage Theater. Hangout of Freemason spooks and a literal propaganda center for the American West hoax. Bloom was her promoter, and that's adorable. Anthony Comstock, the self-stylized weeder in God's garden, and Joseph McCarthy of his day, arrived at the World Fair in hopes of shutting her act down. But just like everything else in his career, the United States Postal Inspector only managed to make her more popular. To give you a better understanding of the U.S. Postal Inspector's role at the, Ch- at the Chicago World's Fair, uh, the self-stylized Weeder in God's Garden, oh, there's a little rep- repeat there, and Joseph McCarthy of his day made public enemies with Emma Goldman and Margaret Sanger. I checked. The Wikipedia has Emma Goldman playing a pivotal role in the development of anarchist political philosophy in North America and Europe in the first half of the 20th century, but also she was a Russian-born Jew. Meanwhile, you all probably know about Margaret Sanger. Sanger not only popularized the term birth control, if you recall an age-old Kane invention, but established the very organization that we know today as Planned Parenthood. Sanger was famously persecuted for her book, Family Limitation under the Comstock Act in 1914, which brings us right back to Anthony Comstock again. That was Comstock's role, to give the government a moral facelift, but only the illusion of choice. We've seen this time and again. His efforts may have given the impression that certain forces within the government were fighting against an onslaught of corruptors, but only in such a way that Intel could mask their own operations. Anthony Comstock was one of them. But getting back to Little Egypt again, it would behoove me to overlook the fact that the year in which she is listed as having played the Birdcage Theater, which which was 1881, only then she was known by uh, Spiropoulos or simply as Fatima. Why is that year important? Well, we are making connections, and the gunfight at the OK Corral happened in 1881. October 26, 1881 specifically. That means whatever week or month Fatima bore her navel for rowdy company, boots were on the ground. Also, Fatima was born in 1871. No, the dates are not wrong. I was pressed to take to a double take on that too. 1871 means she would have only been 10 years old when re- performing for the Earps and the Clantons, making her 22 or 23 in Chicago. Makes you wonder if she was granted one of those one-way tickets on the orphan train. They spin it like Fatima graced the birdcage with her presence and furthermore gifted them with a bare-breasted painting of her when, in fact, the birdcage is more than likely letting us in on one of their pet projects by framing it on their wall. By 1892, she was married to somebody who's described to us as a Chicago restaurateur and businessman who was a native of Greece. But knowing how Representative Bloom managed to get his paws upon her, Fatima was in fact surrounded by pimps and handlers her entire life. Also, the painting bears six patched bullet holes. One can be seen above the billy button. And for an added touch, a knife gash in the canvas below the knee. Sounds like fun times. It is at the World Fair where Fatima is accredited as having premiered billy dancing for American audiences. Only then it was known as the Hoochie Coochie, whereas the melody that accompanied her dance would long be referred to as the Snake Charmer song. You guys can probably all think of that song in your head. This coming from a 10-year-old performer at the Birdcage Theater. The wiki makes a specific point of noting how everybody's favorite agent, Mark Twain, had a near-fatal heart attack uh, while personally witnessing the Hoochie in her coochie. Oh, is that what they used to call it? Of course, Wiki quickly adds how the story is unreliable, but that's only after inviting another spook into the fold just to make her narrative more credible when in fact it's all so contrived. The official narrative picks and chooses its connections. It's all done so that westward expansionism might be passed off as completely organic when in fact all I see of the American experience are community organizers and a well-choreographed dance of lies. Speaking of amusements, Bloom's wing of the park ended up reinventing the wheel, literally. Only this time we'd come to know it as the Ferris wheel. The man, the main article has very little to say on George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. and his invention of the wheel, but they did leave a convenient leak by which I was able to ascertain the following information. 
1891, the directors of the World's Columbian Expo issued a challenge to American engineers to conceive a monument for the fair which might surpass the Eiffel Tower, the structure which came about with the 1889 Paris International Exposition. That connection alone should advise us that these world fairs were organized internationally and with intention. Sure, there, there was arm wrestling involved from a capitalist perspective, probably no more flamboyantly than what might go down at any apron or noose-wearing Masonic festival. Anyhow, Ferris put his design forward and the planners rejected it, fearing that a rotating wheel towering over the grounds could not possibly be safe. As if that's not ironic to all the, the temporary buildings they built of, of uh, juju sauce or whatever it's called. Continuing, it says Ferris persisted. The reason being is Ferris had recruited several investors to cover the 400000 price tag of construction and money talks. The joke here is that planning commission hoped that admissions from the Ferris wheel would pull the fair out of debt and eventually make it profitable because, you know, they had an entire city of wonder to build and in as little as two years. Sounds expensive for sure. Then we read the Ferris wheel had 36 cars. Well, I'll just skip all that, but going on. Wow, what a Ferris wheel. 36 cars, each fitted with 40 revolving chairs and capable of accommodating up to 60 people. Indoor seating, too. That's a total capacity of 2,160 people at a time. Have you ever ridden one so grand? I haven't. They've got one in London now that ups the ante. Not bad, though, for a first go at it. When did you say? Continuing. After the fair closed, Ferris claimed that the exhibition management had robbed him and his investors of their portion of the nearly 750000 profit that his wheel brought in. He spent the next two years in litigation. After the fair's closure, the management robbed Ferris and his investors of $750,000. That's what Ferris claimed at any rate. We have already read how Ferris's wheel carried some 38,000 passengers per day, each ride completing two revolutions and lasting 20 minutes. How much money would something like that pull in? We're told it costs 50 cents per ride. That's $19,000 per day. Not too shabby, even for today's prices. The Ferris wheel would have brought in millions of dollars. Regardless, Ferris spent the following two years in litigation, demanding his fair share. But I'm willing to be I'm um, I'm willing, willing to bet that's all a part of the script. The entire narrative would have been passed off in the media as corporate greed, when in fact everybody had to play their part in the psychodrama. Who else was inspired by the sights and wonders of ancient Chilaga but George C. Tellu? We read right here that Tillyu was so inspired by the sights he saw on the Midway that he dreamt up America's first major amusement park, Steeplechase Park in Coney Island. Once again, I was given very little to work with, just one solitary sentence. But that's not to say the wiki doesn't hand me off to an another link or two, should I be willing, which I most certainly was. Uh, Chilago was Tellu's honeymoon destination, as we see right there in Wikipedia. In and of itself, that's not the strange part. Of the 27 million people who visited the fair, you figure one or two of those couples would arrive on their honeymoon. Wanting to buy a Ferris wheel on one's on one's honeymoon, however, is only a little strange. I mean, rather than a second or third round trip ticket, what better way to express love for your bride than buying her the entire thing? It would make the perfect addition for the backyard. What really dabbed my attention, though, having learned that Ferris and his investors spent the following two years arguing for their fair cut of admission, is the fact that his offer to purchase the wheel only fell flat because it had, it had already been sold. A scrounging mission in the Matrix did not reveal who purchased it. I did, however, recover the following information. The wheel was disassembled and moved to North Clark Street, where it operated from 1895 to 1903. The wheel was then sold a second time. Again, it was dismantled and then rebuilt in St. Louis, Missouri, just in time for the 1904 World's Fair. Afterwards, the wheel was demolished using 200 pounds of dynamite. Its remnants were sold for scrap metal. Why? Seems to me like dismantling the wheel rather than blowing it to kingdom come would be far more profitable. Furthermore, the company who purchased it at auction, and for a price tag of $8,150, was the Chicago Wrecking Company. 
just so we're clear, the company which purchased the wheel which Ferris built and then had it demolished was the exact same company which was founded for the demolition of the Chicago World Fair. The Nina Pinza and Santa Maria, lest we forget the stated purpose of the Chicago Fair, was to celebrate 400 years since the discovery of America. What better way to drill that nonsense into people's heads than by personally sending out invites to the Nina Pinza and Santa Maria? So glad they set aside their busy schedule and showed. Indoctrination is neat, don't you think? It says the Nina, Pinsa, and Santa Maria were very popular attractions. The boys down at Intel, uh, or at the local carnival committee, are very proud of that point. The entire operation was a wild success. I was able to track down a picture of the Nina and Pinsa sitting at port. Somebody must have been uh, sailing around the lake with the Santa Maria when the photographer brought the, his camera out. Appropriate, though, since even the official narrative has the Santa Maria sinking on Christmas Eve. The contrast between the pint size of those ships and the purportedly fake buildings are indeed stunning, are they not? We are told the three original ships which Columbus sailed upon measured in at the whereabouts of 56 feet each and housed 86 to 89 men. Ridiculous. I guess it's a slightly better story than the uh, aluminum bucket they shot up to the moon. Still more believable than the September 11th narrative, though. Was the popularity of the attraction based upon men's uncanny ability to gawk in perplexity, perplexity at their own cognitive dissonance? Seems so. I continued searching for a photo of the Santa Maria and only managed to find evidence of a Viking ship, complete with two United States flags. Probably not the Santa Maria, but you can never be too certain. Perhaps Intel wasn't ready to commit to the Leif Erikson narrative quite yet. Really, though, if I had to choose a ship to discover America with, I'd probably go with this one. Call me old-fashioned, but a Viking ship is definitely more my speed. After the boredom of, of the wind on, on a sail sets in, nothing says exercise quite like a good row across the Atlantic. And really, what could be better? What could be a better combination of relaxation meets adrenaline junkie when we picture ourselves taking in a little sun on our chest while splashing on dabs of war paint rather than sunblock? I'm game if you are. Perhaps by some freak accident, like in Lore of Old, we'll leave Globe Earth behind us and discover the undying lands. You never really know. Another web search claims this one is the Santa Maria. Hard to tell, though. There's really no way of knowing. Never mind, there they are, all three of them, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, making the voyage across four centuries to the newly constructed World Fair. Call me a skeptic, but I'm pretty sure they're all three in on it. Mum's the word, though. Gotta keep the psyop afloat, and nobody would know better than those three ladies. Loose lips sink ships. Part 5. This is where I, I'm, I'm really excited by this part. I don't know if people really talk about this when talking about the World Fair. H.H. H. Holmes, The Genealogy of America's First Serial Killing Hoax. In recent years, there's been a series of strange headlines detailing Meghan Markle's distant relations to H.H. H. Holmes, America's first serial killer. They're cousins, sure. But why make a deal over Meghan Markle? I mean, if we're going to talk about distant cousins, then the media is being rather selective, don't you think? Meghan Markle is, is related to Holmes but she's also related to everybody as spooks go. Then again, so is H.H. H. Holmes. They're both royals with hundreds of kissing cousins to prove it. We'll get to a few specifics of his pedigree in a moment. But first, we need to deal with the elephant in the room. H.H. H. Holmes was not America's first serial killer. No, I am not saying there was a serial killer who existed before him. Rather, he wasn't even a serial killer. He was only tried and convicted of one confirmed kill, and that was his business partner, Benjamin uh, Petizel. Mind you, one confirmed kill isn't exactly how the media framed it in 1896. Be sure to plant your very first Buzz Aldrin moon flag into the May 7th headline of the Chicago Evening Star, because the newspaper reporters, or the boys down at the lab, had already dubbed Holmes America's first serial killer. Apparently, serial killing was expected to become a thing, as if that's not suspicious. The Evening Star goes so far as to claim that Holmes confessed to 27 murders, with nine of those confirmed. 
but that 250 corpses were likely involved. Sure, let's go with that. If my understanding of the prosecution process is even re remotely correct, then nine confirmed murders of the 27 which he confessed to would strictly imply in every sense of the word that those nine murders were in fact confirmed and not speculated. He would have therefore been tried for them and possibly convicted, but he wasn't. He was only tried and hanged for the murder of one man, his business partner. There weren't 250 bodies. There weren't even nine to the 27 which he confessed to. There was, in fact, no other bodies. The serial killer part is a painfully obvious hoax. This leads us to our next likely conclusion, which is that even the murder of his business partner was faked in order to sell newspapers. Let's see what this says here. Holmes arrived in Chicago in August 1886, which is when he began using the name H.H. H. Holmes. Um, Oh, let's skip. Um, I'll read this whole thing. He came across Elizabeth S. Holton's drugstore at the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in Inglewood. Holton gave Holmes a job, and he proved to be a hardworking employee, eventually buying the store. Although several books portray Holton's husband as an old man who quickly vanished along with his wife, Dr. Holton was a fellow Michigan alumnus, only a few years older than Holmes, and both Holtons remained in Inglewood throughout Holmes' life and survived well into the 20th century. It is a myth that they were killed by Holmes. Likewise, Holmes did not kill alleged castle victim Miss Kate Durkee, who turned out to be very much alive. So even modern investigators into the Holmes serial killings are pressed to admit that people who were reported murdered were in fact later found to be alive and well and living in the same neighborhood well into the 20th century. Either Dr. Holton and his wife were newspaper illiterates or they never thought it worth their time to report to the media and the police, and most importantly of all, the American consciousness that they were in fact counted among the living. There is, of course, a third option. Dr. Holton and his wife were in on it. We know this happens today all the time. Victims of psychodramatic episodes go about their daily lives, hiding in plain sight, and very few, if anyone, cares to recognize them. You're probably already confused as to who H.H. H. Holmes is and how a bigger budgeted spinoff from the Jack the Ripper psyop plays a part in the 1893 Chicago Columbian Exposition. Well, then just imagine being one of the 27 million people who visited the World Fair and who then opened up their local newspaper afterwards to learn of a hotel room just three miles away and where something like 250 tourists were coaxed in and brutalized. Depending upon which newspaper you read, you might find detailed sketches of homes surrounded by his murder victims, women and children, of course, or the very trunk which he used to murder the uh, Petizel sisters with. Perhaps another contains blueprints to his murder castle, as it was known, where police claimed to find secret passageways and airtight rooms that were connected to pipelines filled with gas, which Holmes reportedly used as gas chambers. Oh dear. Intel was already taking the gas chamber story for a spin. I'm willing to bet there were people reading this dribble in just about every small town in America who quote-unquote knew somebody who stayed there, or in the very least knew someone who knew someone. So how dare you question it? Any one of us could have been his next victim. That's how these psyops work. It's all psychodrama. Continuing, victims were killed in a mixed-use building which he owned in Chicago. Located about three miles or five kilometers west of the 1893 World's Fair Columbian Exposition, supposedly called the World's Fair Hotel, informally called the Murder Castle, though evidence suggests the hotel portion was never truly open for business. Thank you for that wiki. Besides being a serial killer, Holmes was also a con artist and a trigamist, the subject of more than 50 lawsuits in Chicago alone. Holmes was executed on May 7th, 1896, nine days before his 35th birthday. As always, the Wikipedia does its part to keep the psychodrama alive and will in our consciousness. They tell us it was supposedly called the World Fair Hotel, which is just another way of saying there never was such a place to begin with. Sometimes Intel thinks these things up later on in the creative process, just like any Hollywood movie needing recuts. Our writers of history then mock us by calling him a con artist, because that is exactly what he was. Holmes conned everybody. 
And then we read, uh, on May 7th, 1896, while well, this is some small print for my eyes tonight, Holmes was hanged uh, at such and such prison, also known as the Philadelphia County Prison for the murder of Pitazel. Until the moment of his death, Holmes remained calm and amiable, showing very so uh, few signs of fear, anxiety, or depression. I wonder why. Despite this, he asked for his coffin to be contained in cement and buried 10 feet down. This is where it really gets good. Because he was concerned grave robbers would steal his body and use it for dissection. Oh, no. Holmes' neck did not break. He instead strangled to death slowly, twitching for over 15 minutes before being pronounced dead 20 minutes after the trap had been sprung. Wow, that's pretty dramatic. Upon, upon his execution, Holmes' body was inferred in an unmarked grave at Holy Cross Cemetery, a Catholic cemetery in the Philadelphia western suburb of Pennsylvania. You see, con artist, Holmes requested for his coffin to be buried 10 feet down in cement because he was concerned grave robbers would steal his body and use it for dissection. How awful of them that somebody would want to steal his body and dissect it just to see if it were really him. And once again, not suspicious at all. Whether or not his empty coffin scratch that body was buried 10 feet under in cement with a fake skeleton in it isn't important. Our writers of history simply want you to know that he suggested it, thereby insinuating that his real body will never be found. In fact, one line down, it says exactly that. Holmes was interred in an unmarked grave at the Holy Cross Cemetery. Therefore, even if you did exhume a body in an unmarked grave and it wasn't him, then that just goes to show that he was buried in another unmarked grave, which you'll never find. Keep reading a little further and we stumble upon yet another lovely gem. It says that uh, the castle itself was mysteriously gutted by fire in August 1895. According to a newspaper clipping from the New York Times, two men were seen entering the back of the building between 8 and 9 p.m. About half an hour later, they were seen exiting the building and rapidly running away. Following several explosions, the castle went up in flames. Afterwards, investigators found a half-empty gas can underneath the back steps of the building. The building survived the fire and remained in use until it was torn down in 1938. The site is occupied by the Inglewood branch of the United States Postal Service. Why am I not surprised to learn that the murder hotel burned down to the ground before anybody who wasn't a Freemason, Jesuit, actor, spook, or newspaper man was afforded his own private tour? Also, I'm shocked to learn that no witnesses in the arsonary were ever found. Shocked, I tell you. And not just one explosion, but several of them. Must have been all those gas chambers. In other accounts, we are told about an aspiring entrepreneur who purchased the building after Holmes was hanged for murder, intending to make it into a bludgeoning tourist attraction. Some, tr some dreams never come true. Bummer. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for. Meghan Markle. Often these things take time. Holmes and Markle are fourth cousin, four times removed via John Mudgett. That's what newspaper writers keep making a big deal about. But why stop there? Holmes is a cousin with the Pillsbury family and the Folger family, J.P. Morgan and Milton Bradleys, as well as the Rockefellers, somebody named Bill Gates, and another named Disney. He's got signers of the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence in his family, as well as dozens of state governors. Princess Diana of Wales is a tenth cousin, three times removed via Thomas Thorne. They're all related. I was able to track down 22 United States presidents in his family tree, and that's no small feat of inbreeding. First and foremost, he's related to George Washington, the big kahuna of presidents. Their 15th cousins, five times removed via Sir Robert D. Ross. Other presidential cousins include, but are certainly not limited to the following names. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, James Madison, Chester Arthur, Ruthard B. Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, uh, Franklin Pierce, Herbert Hoover, William Howard Taft, Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Grover Cleveland, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Richard M. Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and of course, the uh, Bush, uh, Bush and son, uh, who's not related to them, if you're a spook. Holmes' true claim to fame, however, can be directly linked through his eighth great-grandfather, John Winthrop. Recognize the name? He was governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. To top that off, he is directly descended from six Magna Carte sureties. Robert Fitz Walter is his 20th great-grandfather, William D. Obney, uh, Robert D. Ross, Sahara D. Quincy, and Roger, laid by God, make up his 21st great-grandfather's 
whereas Richard D. Clare comes in at a 24th. Next, um, oh, and I think I left out an extra by god there. There should be two by gods, which would make nine, um, whatever. Uh, no, whatever. Next comes the noted monarchs of history. William the Conqueror, King of England, 24th great-grandfather, King Robert I, King of France, 29th great-grandfather, Alfred the Great, King of the Anglo-Saxons, 31st great-grandfather, and Charlemagne, King of the Franks, 34th great-grandfather, thereby, thereby granting homes in the anti-Messiah bloodline. I have seen far more royal spooks than Holmes. I mean, there is a reason why he ended up with the assignment that he did. He could have had 12 or more Magna Carta surties for patriarchs. It ended up becoming a New York Times bestseller or America's darling as an actor, maybe even a U.S. president. But no, he only descended from six, which makes him royal and still spook material, but probably far too muddied as blue blood goes. Here's a fun fact, though, because today I'm full of them. Hopefully you haven't forgotten about Daniel Burnham. You know, the, the world's Columbian Expo architect, their 16th cousin, two times removed, via Sir John Howard. I think this is my favorite part right here, uh, the, big, the big climax. Part six, the art of psychodrama. <clears throat> Quick coffee drink. H.H. H. Holmes wasn't the only murder hoax of the 1893 season. Even the mayor of Chicago was assassinated. Never waste a good psyop, I guess. Unless we forget the 1893 Columbian Exposition was burned to the ground. That's taking the grand finale at the fireworks show a bit too far, don't you think? Unfortunately, the writers of history don't let me do the thinking for them. I wish they would, but you know how it is. All I or any of us can do is point out how ridiculous their narrative is. It's not like they don't know what they're doing. There are very few accidents. I mean, they could have burned down the city without ever putting a fare on. But where is the fun in that when you can draw 27 million people out from their homes to gaze and wonder at a millennial kingdom city and then lie to them about it? I've chosen to call this chapter psychodrama for a reason. That's how they mold us and shape us into the image of the beast system, by thrusting us into the ring of a stage ceremony and then telling us to survive it. I've explained psychodrama far better in past writings. Let's just say the performance is fake, but the magic is real. And indoctrination is a gripe. While it arouses our emotion, the performance must be faked. That much is intentional. What they're after is our consent to be fooled. Who are they, you ask? The actors, of course. And here's one of them. Assassin According to Wikipedia article, Assassination of Mayor and End of Fair, the fair ended with the city in shock. Shock, I tell you, as popular mayor Carter Harrison Sr. was assassinated by Patrick Eugene uh, Prendergast two days before the fair's closing. Oh dear. Closing ceremonies were canceled in fair of a public memorial service. We've seen this all too often. The assassination of Chicago Mayor Carter Harrison Sr. only two days before the close of the fair resulted in the cancellation of closing ceremonies. Aww. If you insist this was a coincidence, then wait until we arrive at the 1901 Pan American Exposition, because, oh boy, they knew how to drive the stakes up in the sequel. Assassinations have been, long been a favorite intel psyop and a perfect way to draw mass consciousness into the intended spill. Imagine the 27 million visitors who would have read about Carter Harrison in the news and then mourned for his passing. That's a good way of giving a titty twist to their cognition, so that the onslaught of indoctrination they were spoon-fed in the trough of the New World Order might better do its work. We then read on October 28, 1893, a few months into his fifth term, and just two days before the close of the world's Columbian Exposition, Harrison was murdered in his home by the same guy, a disgruntled office worker who had supported Harrison's re-election under the delusion that Harrison would reward him with an appointment to a post within his mayoral something or other. You have to visit Carter Harrison's wiki page to find out the murder happened at in his home. I'm taking this to mean there were no witnesses, making a nice and clean getaway, and the undertaker was probably a lodge brother. I will be accused of making this crap up, or in the very least, flinging enough of it against the wall to see what, if any of it, sticks. Well, all I can say to that is, I've seen enough of these assassination psyops to recognize a hoax when they come along. Lincoln, hoax. McKinley, hoax. Both Kennedy's brothers, hoaxes. 
Ford, hoax. Lennon, hoax. Reagan, hoax. This one has all the same familiar markings. And when you know it, they're going with the disgruntled employee. Oh, joy. No doubt a parody of all the people who were taken advantage of for capitalism and the future of humanity, or took one for the team in the name of westward, westward expansionism. Harrison is interred in Graceland Cemetery. His tomb has an obelisk sticking straight up towards the glassy firmament, kind of like a middle finger pointed heavenward. Biggest, fattest, and most erect in the entire cemetery, likely. Can't miss it. It's almost like they're trying to tell us something, but as always, that's probably none of my business. We then read that the guy who killed him, uh, Prendergast, was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to death for the assassination. He was executed by hanging on July 13, 1894. The only client of famed attorney Clarence Darrow to ever receive the death penalty. Clarence Darrow? That's what the sign reads. The attorney for Patrick Eugene Prendergast was none other than Clarence Darrow. Not the first stage performance I've seen this guy a part of. It was his first loss in the script, though. Had to play his part before making it to the big time. In case you're left unaware as to who Clarence Darrow is, he's the attorney in the Scopes Monkey Trail. Enough said. It was all a serial drama. If you're wondering what side he was on, though, Darrow was pitted against William Jennings Bryan. There were several other big-profile cases in his career, but before his retirement, Darrow took on the Massey case in Hawaii or Hawaii. Only this time he was coming to their defense as a friend of the family. The, the Massey trial, of course, brings us right around full circle again to the House of Hastings. It was another stage performance appropriate since his career started with one. And I actually uh, wrote a little bit about, about the Massey trail, uh, trial a couple years ago in a different paper. I didn't link it here, but that's how I knew about that. And now we get to it. The destruction of the 1893 Chicago World Fair. The cold storage building was known as the greatest refrigerator on earth, and it was the first to go down. The lower level provided cold storage for thousands of pounds of food served every day at the exposition, whereas the upper story featured an ice skating rink. I read somewhere that plans were drawn to refinish the exteriors in marble after the fair was completed and the exhibitors had gone home on the Reading Railroad. Makes sense. Good labor is hard to come by in two years' time, you know. Best to build a city by the crafty hands of cake caterers and ice sculptures and then do the job right afterwards. Don't ask me to find that source again. I simply read it somewhere and believe it to be so. Because really, a lame story like that does sound like one of their many chronic excuses. And yet again, another clever diversion from the obvious. The buildings were centuries old, and the fire was always intended to be so. The media seems incapable of doing anything on a nation or worldwide level unless a hoax is involved. I mean, can we really expect a chronological liar to tell the truth, even when they're handed the winning argument? Why raise the bar for the media then? Newspapers sell a spellbinding story in the same way that I can smell a psyop, and the July 22, 1893 cold storage building fire was no exception. Those are some detailed sketches particularly the destruction of the cold storage building. Lots of people with cameras at a fair. Was nobody around to photograph it? There were. Why not just use real pictures then? And yet the drawing is so lifelike. Are we expected to believe the fire department brought along a courtroom sketch artist? Notice how they pencil in the same falling man that we would later experience on 9-11. It's a tarot card thing. Well. What do you know? Somebody was present to snap a picture. Is it just me, though, or does this picture look fake? I have seen plenty of pictures of movie sets, and looking at this, it would be difficult to tell a difference between them. Ironic, since the World Fair is sold to us as a movie set. An extra, an extra is walking along reading a newspaper while the chaos ensues. But far more glaringly, we are expected to believe the cold storage building is dead and has become a ghost already. Look at how it fades away into eternity after its untimely passing. So sad. You can see right through it as, as it leans over and collapses. Even temporary buildings have souls, and that's what one of them looked like, I guess. Live such a short life, too. You didn't believe me when I said it was a movie set, did you? Explain to me, then, the drawing of a fire in the background. 
The people are real in the foreground, but they're all staring at a cartoon. I'm not seeing a director, but that's no biggie. You figure somebody yelled action, which then prompted the fire carts to gallop down the street, bills clanging, while everybody stared off into the distance. I've been staring back and forth at both pictures for a few minutes now, and I'm somewhat certain the cartoon fire takes chronological presence before the ghost tower picture. The building is far more destroyed in that one, but I'll let you decide. If so, then it tells us that different special effects artists were taking a crack shot at the post-production work as someone neglected to add the ghost tower in the second image. Oh, look, it's the falling man again, positioned exactly in the same way as the newspaper drawing. Are we supposed to believe that's a real person? I'll ask, but I'm afraid to. Does that look like a real person to you? We're still on a movie set, and that's claymation. Not simply the falling man, though. Everyone on the wall is claymation. On closer inspection, even the smoke is a cartoon, as well as the distorted windows. But then again, so are the two men on the cartoon horse and buggy. No wonder why the newspapers decided to go with sketches. The special effects simply weren't up to par quite yet. The only actors I'm inclined to suspect are real people can be found in the middle of the scene. They're either holding up a baseball bat for a good old-fashioned American game um, of run or, or run the Freemason bases, or we're witnessing a gang of Irish immigrants about to beat the snot out of an Italian. Post-edit. I wish I could say I wrote this stuff in order, cover to cover, but that's not always how these things, how these investigations go. I just found what appears to be a reliable picture with no apparent funny business or post-edit special effects, which documents the burning down of the Chicago World Fair. And as you can clearly see, the public were invited to stand around and watch. This is nothing unordinary. There is nothing unordinary about this fire whatsoever. As someone who grew up in Southern California, where wildfires are a thing, the blaze looks precisely as how I would imagine any infernal as it engulfs a permanent residency. That's not to say that uh, Burnham and company didn't introduce their own flair to the architecture. A spire here, molding there, cheap and temporary additions int intended to mask the age of the city. Undoubtedly, the putt-putt shacks and papier-mâché fixes were the first to go. If I need me to spill it out for you, those flames are eating away at quality material. For a city built of popsicle sticks and staff, I'd expect to see the Columbian Expedition reduced to ashes. That's not exactly what happened, though. As you can clearly see, the cameraman focused in upon the wreckage in the foreground, hoping to frame a picture of annihilation, when in fact not even the Statue of the Republic is rendered in ashes, as we're so often told. Fire damage, maybe, but loss of the flames, no. Sure, Burnham's cake toppers are dissolved to ashes, but the millennial structures remain. As far as this picture describes, I'm reminded of the fire of Notre Dame in Paris. As a pedestrian, I was there to inspect the wreckage within days of the fire ceremony. Damage was done, but it wasn't totaled. Difficult to tell from the aftermath photo, but the original statue of the Republic held a globe in its right hand, and an eagle with outstretched wings was perched upon it. You should be able to see them easily enough. I say original, and that is because the statue sculptor supposedly recreated a duplicate after the first burnt down, quote unquote. The recreation still stands in Jackson Park today. The only difference between the two is that the... Um, I think it's Phrygian cap could be seen hanging upon the staff of the original, whereas the recreation exhibits a plaque that reads Liberty and is partly obscured by an encircling laurel wreath. His name is Daniel Chester French, by the way, and he's better known for the Lincoln statue within the Lincoln Memorial. I guess what I'm saying, or rather suggesting, is that the double take of the two seemingly identical statues may indeed be another hoax, in so much that they're both the same, and were victimized yet again by another switcheroo. Still, I'm more inclined to believe that French did indeed create the statue, as it speaks far more esoterically to the plot at hand. Before I outright tell you what I think the statue was intended to represent, let's talk about the eagle and the cap. The eagle we have seen before, only it came to us in the form of, of a phoenix rising out of the ashes. 
We have seen it as part of Napoleon's March to Moscow in my 1812 paper, as well as the revival uh, of the two beasts, Leviathan and Behemoth, in Return to Rome, or Return of Rome. The writers of history have the uh, Phrygian cap deriving from Roman times. The statue on the left, which can be found in the Louvre, depicts a prisoner with the Phrygian cap and is claimed to have been created sometime in the 2nd century. But you and I both know those dates are wonky. Also, girls just want to have fun and wear their Phrygian caps, I guess, especially if they're French girls. The Wikipedia gives us the following information on the cap's official origin story. Although Phrygian caps did not originally function as liberty caps, they came to signify freedom and the pursuit of liberty first in the American Revolution and then in the French Revolution. The original cap of liberty was the Roman uh, Pileus, the felt cap of emancipated slaves of ancient Rome, which was an attribute of Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty. One might argue that the cap's pairing with the Roman goddess of liberty was a later post-mud flood invention. Perhaps so. I can't rightly say right now. Seems pagan enough, though. If I had more time, and I don't, then I would commit to a study on the goddess Libertas and attempt to discover if she's in any way a dude, like the Statue of Liberty. That would make her a dude, but in case you were wondering. Or androgynous. Stop me now because I'm getting sidetracked. The key words in all of this are American Revolution. That's when the Phrygian cap came to signify freedom and the pursuit of liberty. I think I know what's going on here now. I still need to dig my feet into the mud and figure out if anything remotely resembling 1776 happened at all, exoterically speaking. But on an esoteric level, I'm somewhat certain it did. There was indeed a revolution that took place, which included institutionalizing the Illuminati, but only so much as humanity might be freed from the kingdom and that the beast might arise out of the ashes. That's two birds with one stone. Perhaps the Phrygian cap was another artifact of stolen history. Who really knows? What I'm saying is the Statue of the Republic stood over the ceremony, almost like a conductor, and officiated the destruction of the old world order with the ushering in of the new. I can only imagine the loss of the Phrygian cap and an introduction of the laurel wreath on French's second statue gives us the message that the leader of the New World Order is back in black. Satan is in town again and running things. The destruction of the 1893 Columbian Exposition was a controlled demolition, obviously. But even afterwards, the wrecking crew was in on it. You figured they'd have to be. Otherwise, the wrong person might snoop around, dig their noses where it doesn't belong, and begin to ask questions. Our history writers got a little too lazy this time around in telling us that the Chicago Home Wrecking Company was only formed to make Chilaga go away. That's not really the obvious part, though. After cleaning up the, uh, the mess in Jackson Park, the Chicago House Wrecking Company began making their services known to the other world fairs, cleaning up the Trans-Mississippi Exposition of 1899, the Pan-American Exposition of 1901, as well as the St. Louis Expedition of 1904, were all a part of their creative handiwork. And it only makes sense that they would. Gotta have the right people brought, bought and paid for. I didn't mention this, but it just occurred to me, like, why wouldn't they hire local people? Seems like you would put local companies in business. And anyways, there she stands today, the Palace of Fine Arts, or as she's known today, Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry. Isn't it neat how they keep reclaiming buildings like that? One year, it houses the artwork, and then a little later, science. I'm sure that's the first time something like that ever happened, though, seeing as how Burnham conveniently des designated it as a permanent building and all. Also amazing how there's no fire damage. With all that falling ember, not even the roof was scorched. Sure, the Palace of Fine Art survives, but what you won't often hear in the Chicago World Fair narrative, is that the Art Institute of Chicago was also constructed as a part of the Columbian Exposition, and it too survives. Dig around a little, and you'll come to find that the Art Institute was capable of withstanding the Infernal because it was the only building which wasn't built on the fairgrounds. Kind of odd, don't you think? I mean, it wasn't built of plaster, no. The Art Institute was constructed with the sole purpose of permanence rather than temporary. Uh, ChooseChicago.com gives us the following nugget of information. The Art Institute of Chicago building is the second of two remaining buildings from the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. It's also one of the only fair buildings 
not on or near the grounds of Jackson Park. During the six months of the fair, it was used as an auxiliary building for international assemblies and conferences. That pretty much says it all right there. I mean, if you're pressed to build an amusement park for 27 million visitors and in as little as two, two years' time, which is furthermore only expected to run for six months, and you only have the budget and resources for two permanent buildings, then why would you purposely place one of them away from the action? That's a little too convenient and makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Probably why you'll find very little talk about its origins. And anyways, they're, assen they're essentially telling us what we already know. If they built it for conferences, then I think it's safe to say we're looking at another repurposed building. Two years after its destruction, the White City remained in ruins. Newspapers attempted uh, to keep the psychodramatic episode alive on the front burner of the public consciousness for years thereafter. Let the juices simmer in a little longer. Photographs such as these, which was published in the Inland Printer in 1895, demonstrate their underhandedness. Reliving the adventure is one of the ways you can identify a psyop, you know because Intel isn't interested in the day-to-day -day events of real people. They only invest in their own fingerprints, best to retrieve their old movies from the shelf and remind us of their handiwork every five or ten years whenever the anniversary rolls around. In 1895, though, Americans had no appreciation for what was probably already being cooked up in this photo. Whenever it comes down to predictive programming, the indoctrination rarely ever does. Nothing depicted here happened by accident either. The person lounging around in the ruins of Mach Machinery Hall is identified to us as William Wallace Denslow. Remember him? In a few short years, he would become the illustrator for L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Notice how Denslow has purposely arranged the photograph so that only the obelisk remains, reminding us once again of the obvious. The Chicago, the Chicago World's Fair was a satanic ceremony. The end. I survived that. That was exhausting. So thank you for everyone who has hung in there tonight. I am. Yeah. Uh, thank Great you, Mike. Shame. I am. Yeah. Excellent stuff. There's just so much to uh, comment on. I don't even know where to start, but yeah. go ahead. And wow, to say the very least. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about some of the typos in there. I, um, you know, it, it was 80 pages. I blasted that thing out this week, and I had no time to proofread it. So I was just hoping that, you know, it was a sound that the ship holds together. It was a creaky in a few parts, but I think I think uh, her sails went up and we got through it. So. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for seeing through that. Again, you know, I was uh, there were some things I like uh, I I could comment on more was um, like the um, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody uh, his Wild West show, which was really fascinating that that set up as well. And you know, I want to write about how the Wild West was a big hoax, and we all know this, right? I mean, we know it, it had to have been a hoax. But what was interesting about Wild Bill's show. Uh, which he, he pulled in like over a million bucks in his pocket just for him. That doesn't include everyone else on his team. He made tons of money on that. Um, and he, you know, he was a Knights Templar, high, highly ranked Freemasons. In fact, almost all the original cowboys were, were Freemasons. Um, and, and while that show was being put on, a Western historian was putting on lectures like next door or right in the area. And he was lecturing people on the American West, on the history of the American West. Now, mind you, this is 1893. The American West is still going down. Like, you could still go out to the frontier in 1893. But it's just weird that you had a guy, in, you know, indoctrinating these 27 million people on this idea of the American West. Um, I wanted to talk more about that. And then, of course, you know, the big two is Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. I, I didn't touch them because, like, that that would be like another thirty pages right there, and I didn't have time for that. But you know, that's that's the big irony, right? That that Tesla was like kind of throwing things out there that was like this idea of free energy and that kind of stuff. And then Edison shows up, and even though Nikola Tesla worked for Edison originally, haha, uh, you know, Edison comes in and he enslaves people with you know our electricity today. And we're in a millennial kingdom city where if you do your research, uh, it was 
uh, I, it was the priest's job to heal everybody and to make everyone well and to you know give people you know this energy and so on and so forth. So um, just th- there's so much going on in this in this um, in this big reeducation camp that was the 1893 World Fair. And then, of course, there's Frederick Douglass as well. And I find it funny that I find it funny how the government's sponsoring this entire thing. And it's it's so it's so obvious, like, you know, and just so you everyone knows, like, I'm not <laughs> I hope everyone knows I have a great marriage. I, I love my wife and I'm, you know, I'm not like it, it just everyone should recognize that, the, you know, hopefully the feminism is completely controlled by by the government, right? And you see that even back then, women didn't have their rights to vote yet, but the government is sponsoring, so the government didn't want to give women the rights to vote yet, but they're sponsoring a building to, you know, to encourage women to have free thought, uh, and women should have free thought, but you just see how the government is just playing and molding and shaping from the very get-go, and you see Frederick Douglass, who's like, you know, Lincoln's right-hand man, and he's there to to he was a, an ambassador to the country of Haiti, oddly enough. Uh, and so they put all the the black people they'd call them colored back then uh, into this one building, and they brought in like protesters and stuff. Like the government is sponsoring this so that that Douglas can go there and you know like just like Al Sharpton today, like a total pimp, and just like you know and you know just how like just you know throw out racial inequality and all this kind of stuff and make a big deal and and it's just you just see how they're causing that division there and the, where the government has their hand on everything it's just it it was awe inspiring what they were able to pull off in 6 months to the fact that the people who went there and witnessed this they would have remembered this for the rest of their lives this isn't like you know today where just people become annual pass holders at disney like this would have been a one time affair you know and you would have gone the rest of your life remembering everything that you encountered there yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but David Weiss interviews that woman Ruth at 103 years old, and she can remember going to the World's Fair as a little girl, right? She's 103, and this is what she remembers. Oh, and the lights. I just remember the lights, right? Um, and it's funny, too, that you were, what you were just now saying, that, like, they hype all this racism stuff, and I think even back, because I was just listening to something today where they were saying that it really was, um, you know, I had I had such a heavy hand in making businesses um, from private to to public, right? Businesses, even if you think you have a private business, you don't. You have to abide by what the government rules because it's really a public business. And that all came about because of this idea of oh, they were discriminating, right? People were their businesses were discriminating um, discriminating racially, so now the government has to, you know, crack down, and and so now they have their foot in the door, and they can basically determine what any business does at any time. Like now, wear a mask, you know, whatever. So Katie asked a really good question, and I think this is worthy of discussing because, um, boy, anytime Katie asks a question, it's always worthy, but. Uh, she asked this, were there people stepping up at the time saying that this was nonsense? Well, we have, I, I have not seen any record of somebody calling hoax, hoax, right? Um, and, but, but keep in mind though, that look, look how awe inspiring this truly is at how they controlled history, how they just, everything we've been fed is a lie. And so it, it's almost like the, um, the not serene argument. I truly believe, and this is one of the things I loved about Justin Best, that video he came out with like a few years ago on the not serene. I truly believe that the, the, the not serene were a legitimate uh, people group of Torah observant messianic followers who were um, in history leading up to the destruction of Rome. And, you know, we, we hear a few records of them being talked about, but they've been scrubbed. They've been scrubbed from history. Like I believe that there has always been Torah observer. I believe that this movement, this reawakening, is nothing necessarily new. That it's been happening throughout all of history, but this is how they're able to, how powerful it is. Um, I made the comment in here that um, if you were to, 
the H.H. H. Holmes murder, right? And th- this was powerful psychodrama because the pre- the media is saying there were 250 victims and that he had, a, you know, he had admitted to killing like, you know, 27 of them. And there were like seven confirmed, you know, all these like things they were pushing out. And there was this murder hotel and you probably stayed in it, you know, like you, I'm telling you, like the way these psyops work is that, th- and I've said this in there, but there were, uh, if I were to go talk to people and call like bluff on that, like in the 1890s and say, this is, this is just made up trash. Like the media is making this up. Like I would really offend people because people would go, no, you don't understand. I know somebody who was there. I know somebody who was at that hotel or, you know, or I, you know, who knew somebody who was murdered. And that's how these psyops work. And in every small town in America, somebody had a, you know, former football coach who they all loved who was murdered. Right. I mean, the, 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 the newspaper had these real, the, they weren't making well, they were probably making up a lot of people, but the point was is that there were people who were claimed to be murdered who were found out several years, 20, 30, 40 years later, that they were alive and well and working jobs. Kind of like the, uh, was it the Columbia uh, shuttle? The same thing. Like, you know, they, they just go about, they don't even have to move necessarily. They just go about working their jobs and nobody thinks about it. They're like, you, you can't be. The name. <clears throat> Columbia. Please go back to this because we have the District of Columbia. This is. Again, the goddess, the false god, goddess, the like we like like the Statue of Liberty is Columbia, male or female. Again, the um, that's right in our faces. It was the Colombian. They say Columbus, but it's all this other Greek or whatever this goddess of what Columbia represents, which again the enemy. Hmm, that's good. So my, you know, my favorite part, guys, was writing about the. Uh, <laughs> I hope you guys, if you guys were following the pictures, I hope you appreciated the the fake fire at the end. I seriously, when I was writing this this week, I had no idea that that fire was a hoax. I had never heard about that before, and I'm I'm writing it like it's a hoax. I mean, I'm I'm sorry that it's a legitimate. And then I start looking at these photos. I'm like, wait, wait a second, wait, what? Like, what is that? Wait, that that's a that's a ghost. Like it's it's the the ghost of a. That's not a real building. And then I'm looking closer. I'm like, that's a cartoon fire. Like, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I had never seen that anywhere. And I start looking at websites. I'm like, is anybody else talking about this? And I came across websites where they're treating the photos like they're legitimate. Like, they didn't even think to look at it and go, are those real people falling out of that building? That's a claymation figure. Like, that's a movie set. Um, and so this is what I'm telling you. This is why this is... This is what is so important about psychodrama, okay? Uh, performance witchcraft. The, the performance has to be faked. I can't say this enough. This is why these events are faked, faked, faked over and over again. And people ask, well, why can't they do it for real? It's because it is in the performance where the magic does its work. The spell, you know, you give your permission to be fooled and, you know, and believe. That's where the, the realm of the magic is. Like if you've ever been, uh, you know, when my wife and I used to go to Disney back in the day and they would do the fireworks show and you would hear over the loudspeakers, like a child would say, believe. And you would hear that, just that word, believe. And then Tinkerbell would fly overhead. You know, they want you to, that. That's that's how they mold you and they shape you. Like if you, you know, believe in this stuff you know it does its work and that's why they're faked and it's through the the that's why they're actors and it's because they are acting that they act as in doing so they you know incite emotions within us uh laughter joy sorrow fear anger and they you know act as a shaman to open the doorway to the gods and they do their work so uh but i was shocked i'm like reading this and going oh my goodness like this (laughs) this was a fake fire and they they faked it so um anyways that was a good catch because i I was looking at those photos too i thought Wow, even back then they did this to cover su- such uh, stories. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, it's um, I, like I said. I I think you know, uh, my wife and I, uh, Sarah, we were. She's really into the mud flood now. It's so exciting. Like we're sitting on the couch at night and we're just like watching documentaries, and she's so into it. And and we were just like overcome. Uh, we were just talking about it all day today. Just overcome with like almost like emotion with how they 
immediately after the mud flood, they went out. These controllers went out of their way to hide and cover everything. Hey, that's uh, by the way, James. That's an an amazing catch. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, we actually see uh, a shadow uh, differences. The shadows don't line up. That's really interesting. Um, I didn't even think to look at that, which is a, a um, wh which is a rookie mistake on my part because um, that that's something that I've shown to disprove the Zapruder film, the JFK Zapruder film. It's all in the shadows. You can see composite imaging when they're overlaying stuff. Um, the shadows are a big giveaway because they don't always line up. That's a that's a big one. So that's good. Good going. Good job. Were there any um, any other observations or thoughts or anything that I uh, neglected to talk about that anyone wants to mention? Well, what were you just saying about how the programming was deep back then that we're realizing, like, wow, the whole world's a stage. And like you said, that, that cycle, the psyop was happening. And to go, okay, what happened, not just what they were showing there, but again, everything that came before it, once again, was rewritten. Yeah. Um, one more thing, and I want to ask, uh, uh, talk about Patrick's question. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention about that photo that was just dropped in with the, uh, the crowd looking off to the cartoon fire and the shadows are off, is that how I think they pulled that off, like, I don't think that they grabbed all those people. My theory on this is that they didn't grab all those people and be like, you know, let's, let's trick people, right? Like, yeah, maybe that was a bunch of Freemasons. I don't know. But I actually, the way I think they, they did that was that it was like a fire drill. Like, you know, they might have had those at the fair, right? Like, they're going to have a fair, just, we've all been through fire drills. And like, you know, the, the fire trucks race off and everyone's looking. And then there's a photographer up there on the hill. And captured it, um, you know, they didn't think nothing of it, right? They go about their business, and this could have been four months before it burned down, right? Could have been way earlier. And then when it actually burned down and they put this photo out there, nobody would go and look, hey, I wonder if I'm in that photo from my trip out there four or five months ago, right? Like, see, see what I'm saying? Like, nobody's going to really think about that. And if they maybe do that, it's, it's going to suspend their disbelief. Um, and... Patrick asks, was the Ferris wheel old world? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, but we have water wheels, right? So um, I'm curious if, if you know, yeah, if it was the wheel. Oh, that, that's why I said, you know, I kind of said sarcastically, you know, he reinvented the wheel, right? Uh, but there were water wheels go way back, I'm sure. So all they would have done is taken the water wheel and probably some similar principles to it. But uh, what I pointed out was that it was a very impressive. I mean, you look at that that Ferris wheel; it was very impressive for the first time developing the Ferris wheel. Um, most Ferris wheels in in parks today are not that impressive. It was indoors, mind you, which it would need to be in Chicago. It was an indoor. It it you it was the, each cab was so big that it seated any number of people, but it actually had standing room too. Like people could walk around in there. That's how big those were. That was very impressive. For the first time. <sighs> hey, Noel, I just want to say thanks for putting all your effort into this. Uh, it's a lot of information and you do uh, a lot of research. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I want to. <clears throat> I, I put my all into that one. So next week will be I'll be dusting off another um, uh, of my old page. I'm trying to go back and dust off all my old work and improve on it. Um, and so I'll be dusting off another one I did two years ago when I started looking into. Um, it's it's the only paper that has ever outed me supposedly as a preterist, which I 
claim over and over again, I am not a preterist because I do not believe that the Millennial Kingdom was a spiritual, metaphorical kingdom. Uh, I believe that it physically happened, and no preterist ever says that. I'm a, I guess, a post-millennialist. That's what I am. But um, I want to dust off and talk about 70 AD because a lot of people have questions about that. So I'll, hopefully, y'all willing will uh, present that next week, and it shouldn't be as long of a presentation as this week, but. I've uh, been finding some interesting things in there as well. Uh, Mom, Mom Barb, you're asking how this book comes to you. I think, yeah, you just private message me. So I will, um, I will, I'll private message you and we'll, we'll make sure that you get it. You just have to provide, you know, a P.O. box or somewhere you want it shipped, uh, your home address or whatever, and we'll get it out to you. Good night, John. Thanks for coming. You guys can take it away. I've I talked for two hours. My my voice is shot. Well, I think that is interesting. The point that Rob Breath of you brought up here um about everybody wearing hats and bonnets um yeah it's it's like every picture i mean they're they're all wearing it i don't i haven't i haven't seen one i mean you might find some but when you look at the general crowd pictures or every everyone has headwear That one guy has like a top hat and like everyone else has a like a bowler cap. Kind of funny. He's like the one guy in the but crowd. It's, but it's interesting that everybody's wearing them. Not just, you know, a half of them or something. All, everyone is. It's just really interesting. Yeah, I don't know. That's, I, I, you know, kind of love the way they dress personally, so. Well, back until I don't know when it stopped, but what even into the sixties and early, my father always wore a hat. Um, I I think hats didn't like became not a thing. I mean, just it was part of culture. People wore hats. Maybe women stopped wearing them probably before men. But I mean, when you went out and dressed up, you put on a hat man or a woman for up until not that long ago yeah i mean you look at um like disneyland photos from the 1950s into the 60s even into the early 70s and people were still dressing in their sunday best to go to the amusement park like if you go out and you're you're like spending you know we don't really think about it now we'll just you know people blow 70 80 bucks to go see a movie at the theaters or you know whatever but you know you wear just shorts and a baseball cap or not even a hat right but like you're going out there to s spend money back then and keep in mind like this is there was a i i didn't really talk about it, there was a nationwide depression in the 1890s it hit hard um it was one of the worst um they wouldn't see another depression like that until the, the 1930s and then again the 1970s and then again 2008 but um People didn't have like just the money to go spend, and yet some. I, I'm still confused. Like that's the the biggest weirdest thing. I I, I don't even know how they explain. I keep using this number twenty seven million because it defies my belief. How people are living on farms? They've got animals to tend to. They're barely scraping by, crop by crop. They're on horseback, and they all manage to get out to these fairs. Like that defies my belief. It's unbelievable what they were able to pull off. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they, they all dressed up in their, I mean, it, it makes sense. Like that's your big day. You're going to show up in your Sunday best. Yeah, Josh, you asked, is it possible? Are you talking about the 27 million? I don't know. I, 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 that's the thing. I, I kept saying that because I'm like, it's almost like the six million, right? Like, I, I don't even know. That, that's like, it was what, what did I say? It was one third to half of the U.S. population. That's unbelievable that you would get that many people out there. Yeah. Yeah. Half the population 
the travel time, the expense, food, what you'd have to pack in in traveling. Um, I mean, when you think of all these factors, it, it's I, I don't know. It, it I would like to see how they can explain that. That would be interesting to know. Yeah, I mean, it would take you a week. I mean, you would be going by horse, by train, by, you know, like, the trains would take, it could still take two or three days. I don't know how long it took to get across the country in the 1890s. It was still like four or five by train. That's not even by horse or, or um, automobile. That's, that's quite the trek to get everyone out to Chicago. Right. And, and then you see these pictures, and you see everybody decked out in, you know, their, their suits, their hats, uh, their dresses. And, I mean, it's packed And for, for, the, for this event, whether it's the whole two weeks or however long it, the event's going on. But, uh, you know, housing the people, did, was there accommodations of, of hotels? Did, did they have to bust out tents? I mean, that many people? Oh, well. that, that's a lot of people. Yeah, and that's, Katie, you asked the question. That's why I said the farms. Like, who's taking care of these people's farms when they're on holiday to Chicago? Exactly. It, it, half the population is going in six months' time, right? So, likely, your neighbors on both sides, or at least on one of the sides, is going to the fair as well. All right now, um, James, you asked the question: Is the Lincoln hoax a quick explanation? I think I can explain it really quickly. Um, if you were if you're going down an investigative trail, I would start with Lincoln's death mask. Okay, uh, there was like a bronze made of his face of his famous death mask. Well, the problem is is that uh, I think he had, I think Lincoln had three masks made of him in his lifetime. Okay, could be wrong on that. Maybe it's two, but I think it's three. And when you when you look at his death mask, it's actually a combination of the other two. Um, and man, I don't want to misquote that, but yeah, I think that's the case. And I had notes on it from a couple years back. I need to write a good article on this, but that is that's a huge problem right there. Um, so it's like, well, wait a second. Even his his death mask was a combination of the first two. Uh, one was made at the beginning of the Civil War and one a little bit earlier. And you're like, well, okay, that's that's, that's kind of weird. Um, and then you you start looking at uh, like Ford's Theater and the anomalies there. Uh, like the idea that like the Secret Service was like drunk and they're not, you know, they're like falling asleep and all this kind of stuff. And John Wilkes Booth was able to walk in there into his booth and shoot him. He jumps onto the stage. Um, he gives like this ridiculous speech, I think from Shakespeare or something. And then Mary Todd Lincoln waits for him to finish his speech before she cries. Oh my God, that he shot the president. And Ford Theater was only a third filled, probably all until um, it gets even more. Cr well, even I think the hanging of the conspirators, it was probably all until there, but I, even more crazy is you look at like Dr. Mudd, who was one of the conspirators with John Wilkes Booth. He's the guy who tended uh, his leg when he broke his leg in the jump. He was sent to the star fort in um, uh, just uh, Fort Jefferson, just off of uh, Key West. And I've been to, I've personally been to Fort Jefferson and they tell us that that star fort, Fort Jefferson was built during the civil war. Uh, it was made of like tens of millions of bricks that they hauled out there and built, which is the most ridiculous. Even when I was out there, I mean, I, I went out there in, tw in 2006, and I'm thinking I had to accept it, of course, right? It's like, well, somebody built this, and that's what they're telling me, and there's no other explanation, so it must have happened. But it's like it defied any realization, any rationalization that they would build, the union would build a prison way out there in the Florida Keys. That makes no sense whatsoever to even get the resources out there. Anyways, Dr. Mudd stayed out there, but you know, that, that's just the really quick little one. But I would start with the death mask and look at that. And what you start to find is that if they're going to lie about one thing like that, that's central to the death, you can start unraveling it from that point. The same way I did with the, with the Kennedy administration, uh, that the Zapruder film and show that the film itself 
was not even a real film. It was a composite imaging, I think, multiple takes, uh, which means that it was a stage performance. And then you have to ask the question, well, wait a second, if there were multiple takes and there were actors on the stage and their shadows don't match up and all this, you know, composite imaging and people who were not supposed to be there that are distorted and all this kind of stuff, it's like, well, did they actually shoot the president? Right. You just start with that. And then you start going, oh, my goodness, like there, everyone. And so I <laughs> uh, after writing that thing on the JFK piece, every almost every single time I, I, I come out with like a hoax, conveniently, like within a week or two, like somebody contacts me uh, who claims that they were either there or, you know, they know somebody who was there and that therefore I'm wrong because they know someone who's there. So after I came out with that JFK piece. Uh, that was in uh, like September or yeah, September of 20, uh, 2020, I think it was. And yeah, so it was just about a year and a half ago. Somebody contacts me and they're like, well, you're wrong, Noel, because my uncle, I think it was like Ernie or something like that. Like my uncle Ernie was there when he was assassinated. And he went and he picked up a piece of JFK's brain in the street and he carried it uh, to the hospital and handed it to the Secret Service. And I'm listening to his whole account. And I'm thinking, okay. And I, I wanted to ask him. I, I was trying to be kind. And he kept going on. I finally asked him. I said, okay, I have to ask you this. Was your uncle a Freemason? And he's like, oh, yeah. He was a 33-degree Mason. He was like a really high ranking. And I'm like, okay, the jury rests. And then, and he keeps talking. like He's proud of this fact that his, uh, that his uncle was a Freemason. And he said, he, said, um, he said, in fact, he told me this. He said, in fact, everybody there who was in the field or on the grassy knoll or anywhere, he said they were all Freemasons, every one of them. And he thought that that was like kosher and that was cool. I was like, okay, yeah, like uh, uh, clearly it was a ceremony. Clearly they were all in on it. Like it's so obvious, crisis actors, all that kind of stuff. So, and that just begs the question, like if they faked it all, then did JFK really die? Obviously, I don't think he did. I don't think JFK would be on, be okay with you know the Freemasons killing him. Let's put it that way. So, and then of course you find out that the 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 the, the whole second shooter narrative started by a thirty three degree Mason. Like they were even inventing the rabbit trails that were supposed to go down. That they, they're giving us the breadcrumbs that lead to dead ends. And that's why you know was it fifty six years later? Uh, I think it's like sixty years now. Uh, people still are debating it because that's the way these tie up these psyops are intended to be just like with um um uh hh holmes was a spinoff of jack the ripper to this day i think what jack the ripper had like five uh victims or something like that to this day people are still debating jack the ripper because he was set up in such a way um these serial killers are set up in such a way that um you never really know you're never going to get to the bottom of it you'll never find out who the true killer was because there never was a killer and they just lay out false breadcrumbs that's always the way these these work. Wow, thank uh, you. <laughs> so, um, Katie, what do you do? What what do they do with these guys like JFK and Marilyn who leave the stage? Is there a grand resort in the Bermuda? All right. So, I can't answer that, and I can't answer that because obviously I don't really know. Here's what I have found: a lot of these people they put them out in plain sight. Okay, so a good example is the the the. I said Columbia. I should have. Said, I said Columbia. I should have said Challenger. It's the Challenger shuttle. Correction. When the Challenger shuttle exploded in, it was like January of 1986. I remember. Uh, I think I have the year right on that. But I remember watching it when it happened. Um, it's. It just. It's. It like these are. That's the thing about these psychodramas, right? They're like that is frozen in my memory. I remember that moment in time. I remember my students sitting around me. I remember my, the look on my principal's face, right? I remember all that. But all those people, they just went out. They all became teachers and they just, they're still teaching to this day, right? They have this very moment. They are in a semester or maybe ending their, their college semester with students. They're in broad daylight. So people don't really think about that. Now, someone like JFK and Marilyn Monroe would be a little bit uh, harder to hide. And this is where it, it gets, uh, you can kind of split into two areas. One is that I am very open to the belief that they um, are reintroduced as uh, as actors again in another role. Uh, 
one of them that gets really crazy, but I actually think they're actually onto something, is that Bruce Lee actually became um, what's that? Oh, what's his name? The like the theoretical physicist, um, uh, Michachu or whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah, I. Yeah, I've seen some great research that suggests that Bruce Lee is that same guy. And I'm like, they look the same. And I'm like, I think it's the same dude. All right. So some people, and this is where it gets really crazy, like really crazy. I'm not saying that this is what it is, but I have to, I have to suggest this anyways, is that some people have suggested that Jimmy Carter is, and he's still alive, Jimmy Carter is JFK. Now, the reason I, I find that- I didn't say that. I the heard reason, the same thing. Yeah, I find that fascinating because they look the same. And and what better way to take your god, JFK, like he's a god, right, to the Democrats and whoever, uh, to take your god and then basically castrate everybody with Jimmy Carter. Like, it is like, that is exact. I say that because that is exactly what Intel would do. They would roll him back out as another guy and just castrate you. Um, so, you know, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, so the other option, you know, Marilyn Monroe was a dude, right? I mean, they could have just given Marilyn Monroe another sex change. I don't know. But um, the thing is, is that also the Earth is a much larger place, right? The realm is a much larger place. There's, there, there's, there's whole sections of water. Um, that we're not allowed to travel on. NASA, um, you know, NASA plans all flight paths. There are some areas there could be missing land. There could be. Uh, we talked about the moon map, other things. There, I, I think that they very likely. Could. So imagine, like, if the moon map is legit and there's the Earth is literally divided in half. Like, there's a whole another civilization to our kind of northeast uh, that's actually larger than ours. Uh, like and they're all deceived as well. Like the saint, you know, Satan's running it right because he surrounds the camp of Yah, four corners of the earth. He would have to. Um, imagine if like they just reassign the actors and they go up there and they just play a whole different role. Like that's totally possible. There's so many possibilities to what's going on with this. But anyways, have, I have talked long. Have you noticed how Jodie Foster has disappeared? And I swear that I spotted her a couple few years back down in um, Australia as some high level official. I swear it's an older Jodie Foster. I think they just recycle them and recast them like uh, Katie was saying and you were saying. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, have you heard of Ed Chiarini and is that what you're going off of? And, if so, what do you think of the ear biometrics? And do you think he's a shill? I don't. I don't know that context. I can't answer that. Maybe someone else can talk about that. I. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Generally, I only really know about stuff that I've taken the time to research and write. And unfortunately, because like a lot of you guys can like you know you can just pile through information. I mean, it's like. You know, there's so much on the internet in just one day. You can just pile through stuff, but I have to like you know take my time and go through this slowly. I, I because you know I I gotta put it all together and process it and write it, and it just it takes a lot more time. So I, I, most people are you know when you really think about it, like here I am you know talking to this crowd, but most people I think are more knowledgeable than I am. I just happen to be the guy that that writes this stuff down. I'm not sure if anybody can help Patrick. He's saying that he's been saying that for a while that he's not able to hear anybody but me speak. So was there anybody else that had um, any thoughts on the Chicago World Fair or anything we touched on? Well, that whole side up with the mayor. That was great. They bring in a death ritual to end the um, in the um, exposition, <laughs> right there. Expo exposition, yeah. really a stage. And as you mentioned, once again, it was a satanic ritual. Yeah, and um, so I'll be dusting off the a paper on the Pan American Exposition, which was in Buffalo, New York. And if you guys don't know that already, that. Uh, 
the other presidential assassination happened there. President McKinley, surprise, surprise, was assassinated at the World Fair. And it's just like, you seriously? Like, <laughs> they just, they, it, you see, you see, like, you know, like when you watch movies and you just see different genres, right? And you could see how, like, they all spin off on ideas. It's like that with Intel. Like, you see the same regurgitated plots just rehashed over and over and over again. And, um, you know, it was, it, I called it a hoax because I believe it was. I did the least amount of research on that, but it's just like, it, it, I don't know. It's just, it was just a little too obvious that, you know, it, it happened. You know, nobody saw it happen. I've never seen anything on the prosecution process, like how they found out this guy. Was he sitting around conveniently, like Mark David Chapman, just like, you know, just like reading a book, like, you know, like the adventures of Huck Finn, like outside of the mayor's house when the police arrived? You know, like, how did they know this guy was like, we don't know anything. All we know that I've seen from any articles I've read or anything is that. Uh, he just was the murderer because he was. Like, they just told us in the media, oh, no, he was killed by this guy, and he was a disgruntled employee. And 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 then they had the court case. But we don't we don't really know anything else about it. Um, and, it, yeah, it's like, you know, two days, two days before. And it was obviously so just in-your-face, satanic ceremony, psychodramatic episode. Uh, it... It's just upsetting that people keep falling for this over and over and over again. But, you know, it's just like politics, right? Every four years, you forget and you vote again. So in regards to the assassination, um, my wife and I recently watched uh, a mainstream narrative documentary on the expo. And it gives you a, a reenactment of the assassination moment. And the dude, they have him stylized as just pacing back and forth in front of the mayor's house, pain smoking cigarettes, hand shaking. And the narrator, um, I think it was Gene Hackman, he's narrating and he's talking about how this guy is disgruntled and he he was expecting to get this position on the mayor's administration. And instead of waiting a little while, he just goes there with the intent of threatening him. And it's not even a, it's not even a good explanation. So he knocks on the door, and the mayor comes to the door and lets him in because he's so well liked that he just allows random people to come into his house at any time at, at night, 9 p.m., 10 p.m. So the guy comes in, pulls a gun on him immediately, and without even trying to say what he's demanding or what he wants, shoots him like three times and then waits for the police to arrive. Like that, that is the way that the mainstream narrative says there's no witnesses. He just, he shoots him and then he goes out on the porch and he sits there and waits. Like, that's it. I mean, right. maybe, maybe he's crazy, but. Kind of like, kind of, yeah, kind of like the, uh, we see that over and over again, like the, um, the Charleston shooting, uh, that happened like a year before we arrived in Charleston. And it was the same thing with that, the boy who conveniently looked just like the, the, the child from kindergarten cop, um, uh, Dylan Roof, or no, wait, Dylan Roof was uh, well, uh, Littleton, right? But anyways, um, no, if it was Dylan Roof, maybe. And um, he, he was just sitting out there on the curb, like holding a Confederate flag, you know, just, just to be like, here I am. You know, it's just like, whatever. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think you said uh, Gene Hackman, but I think it was, you're referring to uh, Gene Wilder, right? The, yes, the, yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I've never seen that documentary. So um, I, I actually wanted to, I just didn't have the time when I was, um, I was just going off like wiki articles and that kind of stuff. But um, Katie wins the reward tonight for the most awesome questions asked. And um, she asked, did you say you have done some research on the Wild West? I assume in the context of it being a hoax. And so that's something I will be dusting off. Like, um, because, and I'm actually going to be pre preparing that, hopefully, y'all willing, in the next few weeks. So there's so much here to to touch on on the Wild West. Like, you know, the fact that, all the first cowboy actors were Freemasons, pretty much. John Wayne was, a, of course, a, huge, a very highly ranked uh, Freemason. Um, the original cowboys themselves, the like White Earp and Company, the um, uh, Billy the Kid and the Clantons and 
you know, all different, they were like all Freemasons. And, you know, you, you hear their stories being told in dime novels, the people writing them are Freemasons. It's almost like the Freemasons are just basically making this stuff up and writing the American West and the American consciousness. And um, the reason why we can say it's a hoax is because, you know, you go to California, you go to Colorado, you go to Texas, Minnesota, you go all over and you see these big, beautiful uh domed buildings, Corinthian pillars that are, they're all like owned by the government. They're, you know, the government has moved in to, uh, to invert everything that happened in the millennial kingdom where, you know, the, these priests are living in them and to benefit humanity. You know, when Yahusha says that, um, I was just talking to my wife about this today, when Yahusha talks about treasures in heaven, like if we think about those treasures in heaven, like smog, the, the dragon and the hobbit, like, you know, and, oh, we're going to have piles of gold and, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, that's like thinking like a cane. Like when he talked about treasures in heaven, I think that we're getting a glimpse in this research of just seeing what the priests were doing. The treasure was that this wealth that they were given was actually uh, serving humanity. Like, that's a really interesting way to think about it. But anyways, so the reason why I can say it's a hoax is because all these buildings existed. The trains, uh, the train tracks already existed. Um, and it, it was all, it was all, you know, this idea of, of westward expansionism is true in a way because they were repopulating and pushing back out. They had to have these stories. But then you see, like, the, the Alamo was a total false flag attack. I do believe there was probably some type of Alamo event. Um, and, you know, the Donner Party was a hoax, all that. But, you know, interesting thing about the Alamo was I actually saw this in a John Levy video recently where he compared photos. Oh, I wish I could track this down again. It was so awesome. He compared photos of the Alamo. Um, and Katie, you're from Texas, and I'm sorry because, you know, you know, I'm messing with Texas at this at this point. Um, but he compared pic pictures of the Alamo with its other, like, Grand Cathedral. And they looked exactly the same. And I'm like, oh, like the Alamo was actually like this big, beautiful Millennial Kingdom building. And they just blew it to hell. And, and, like, and they're and they're like, and they, they make it out. Like, because I've been to the Alamo. I'm sure you have too. And you, you go up there and you're like, it's so small. It looks like, you know, like, a uh, looks like somebody's, like foyer in Beverly Hills. Like, you know, just the entrance to their house. It looks so small. And, uh, or like someone's garage or something like that. And I'm like, but they defended this from like, you know, a whole arm. But yeah, I, I totally think that they're just like, they blew up this, uh, big, beautiful building and they make it out like, like this little tiny mission or something like that. And I just think that the whole thing is conjured. I don't think David Crockett ever died. Um, I just, you know, just, it, it, you just, you see this thing cyclically over and over again. And you just, eventually you just start seeing through it and you're just like, this, this can't be so. Well, Rob, what is the, what is the context of that, um, that photo there of the fair with the parade? Do you know? I don't know the exact context. I just know it's, it, it was taken from the, um, the Chicago World Fair. So I, I, I might have been maybe like the opening ceremonies or something like that, and all the people gathered uh, to to watch. I give you the reward tonight for putting out pictures that I have never seen. Like I like these are like you got to dig deep to find this stuff because this is not on the mainstream websites that I was looking. So these are really awesome pictures. And what were you? Um, Okay, so this other picture though is from San Francisco. What was uh, 1856? What were you insinuating in here? Well, when I looked up when was the telephone lines invented, uh, it's like 1877 when telephone lines were started uh, because I think it was 1876, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, you know, with the telephone. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So the lines didn't start going into effect till 77. And here I'm just showing that here is a telephone pole like structure with something on it. And then in the background of the, on top of that building, you see three antennas of some sort. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's just interesting to, to see some of these things and look at them. Well, what, what's also really freaky about San Francisco was the, the fire itself. Uh, and I give it to Martin Lickey. Um, some of his, you know, you know, his videos are just endless and they just go on and on and on. He does it like every single day. Like this, he just does these like five hour videos or whatever. But, um, he, 
I was just watching one of them, and he's showing how the city of San Francisco, the aftermath of the fire, looked pretty closely to what we saw with the California fires a couple years ago. That you know, where you see things like just melted, and then like everything is like green around it, but it's just like you know, just this one little section is just burnt to a crisp. And he's just showing where telephone poles um, are still erected. Um, but there might be like one building completely burnt down, but then there's shrubbery around it. And he was like, I'm like, this is some bizarre anomalies for, you know, something like this. And he, you know, he was making the point that they had some sort of super weapon that they, um, destroyed the city with, which, you know, I obviously believe that that's obviously, you know, what they were doing was they were, they were planned demolitions. Um, but. So they had do weapons back then. <laughs> when were they, well, when were they well, off in times? When did they start? I, was, I don't yeah. know. Because I was just thinking, we're looking at people in this time time period, end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. And if we think about their age and go, okay, 30, 40, 50 years old. So these guys were born in 1850. These guys were born after the mud flood. Most of these people are going to these um, expositions and world fairs and whatnot. So they're already... We got to realize it's already um, a time where they've been cut off from the history before. Yeah, they're already in the reprogramming phase. Yep. Maybe the uh, they ship the uh, orphans out on a field trip to the world fairs. Um, I was going to say on the on the dim, the the super weapons, whatever. Um, that the same thing happened in eighteen twelve. With uh, in the roundabouts, it might have been like eight, 1814 or whatever, but it was um, Napoleon's march out to Moscow. And the city burned down before Napoleon got there. And, you know, I think official, I think the official narrative has that the, 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 the Russians burned down their own city. But there are accounts, though, of the actual Russians sitting in there talking about how they actually saw a second sun. There was a sun and then another sun appeared. And then it just started like, like melting things. Like things started combusting and, you know, catching on flames and people started dying. Um, and so there was like, it's literally like some, the second source of fire in the sky. Um, and that's a complete mystery. We don't know what that was, but I don't know if it was supernatural. I don't know what it was. I don't know if a government weapon. I, I don't know, but yeah. Was so definitely an asteroid. I, I, yeah, I don't even know how to comment to that. But yeah, I, I'm glad you chuckled after that. But yes. Yeah, but, I was obviously joking. <laughs> Being sarcastic. So it just keeps reminding me of Westworld. In that... <laughs> Westworld in a similar way that we're presented with these simulations that are supposedly, you know, the fake world. You go to Westworld and it's the Wild West. You go here and it's old Japan. You go to this one and it's, they had different versions. I'm not sure if there was a book or anything, but they hinted it at the newer ones. But it goes, what I'm getting at is the programming again. That not only were we programmed in that age, we were programmed what came before. So it's almost like, how do I say it? Um, it seems, again, that people, um, when you're told your history was something different, you're going to live your present differently. So it's just, it's this confusion of what what is what is real, what, what, what wasn't, what isn't real, because what we're, what we're looking at is that men are, all our history has been a lie that we've been fed to us. Now we're looking at people a hundred years ago or so being shown history that once again, we're realizing now was a lie also. And so we have a pretty good timeline of how life has been, the last uh, 120 years or so. The 1800s are pretty open what really went down there. We just see the beginning of the, 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 the mud flood, the, um, 
the heavy programming with these um, world fairs. Um, all sorts of rewriting of the narrative, the re of the all of this going down. And then on top of that, told a false history that is passed to today. Like the revolution, what did we talk about, whether it's the Civil War, the Wild West, cowboys and Indians, how, again, how things were and how people were living back then. Um, so it's really like, to me, a movie set that which you keep putting up, um, bringing up. It's like this world stage. And America has really been one of those, like, okay, here we are. Change the narrative now. You guys are this, you guys are that, and you guys are this. You were, you know, you guys are going to play these this role. So it really has seemed to have been, been like this. Hmm. It's, so it's like, okay, I, because, you know, people say about the American history, I'm like, whoo. If we look at like now, it's like, how can you like go back? We can't really go once again. This is what got us onto the Millennial Kingdom, where we couldn't really go back to 300 years without going, then there's really not making sense what's going on. And so once again, the programming of society, the programming of the people has been really heavy. Really, really heavy. And like you say, one generation, boom, we're, we're already, the history's in the past. Only a few people are still researching it, looking at it. Everyone's, most everyone has moved on in the hustle and bustle and surviving of day to day. And okay, this is what they told us. So we can see that happening today, even with, um, on another end, with so much information out there, even though now with the censors, the, you know, the so-called censoring, the, well, no, the censoring and the fake news, all the information out there, we're still at the same, same thing. We're like, we don't know. They've been lying so heavily about our history that up until today, we don't know. Like, we don't know, like we keep saying, all these things are hoaxes. These wars over here and rumors of wars, what they maybe have capabilities of or what they might not. Whoa, we're really living in a land of confusion. Um, Patrick asks a really great question, and I want to address that. And Rob, if you have the, uh, if you know where what I'm going to be referring to, if you could uh, really find it, like type it in Deuteronomy 30 or whatever. Um, he asked a question, since we've been living in the time of great deception, when Hasatan has been loose upon the earth, and the Millennial Kingdom has been destroyed, do we get extra grace? And um, I think in the grace argument, um, yes. I, I, I believe that uh, Yahuwah is, as much as you, as you guys know, I put a heavy focus on we need to be obedient to the most high that we are here on this earth um, because it is a test um, to see if you who really if you who wants to spend an eternity with us um, and i know that goes against the, the 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 you know the cultural you know norm and churches and understanding and stuff that you know we all have this you know the right to live with them whatever but you know it says that he prophesies and uh, moses says uh that in deuteronomy that in the latter days when we're scattered to the furthest ends of the earth in the diaspora of yasharel is what, what we're in now um that you know when we remember his name again and throw aside our idols uh that he says he will be a gracious elohim to us um, and see, maybe this is the verse here, Deuteronomy 31. So it will be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse. Um, and I'll just quickly say here that obviously we are the result of the curse uh, because our descendants took place in the rebellion against the kingdom and they were tossed out to the curve that they're, you know, tossed out on their, on their butts. And we are their descendants of the curse which I have placed before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations which Yahuwah, your Elohim, has scattered you. So here we are scattered all over the earth. 
And you return to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and obey him with all your heart. So there it is. You need to obey him with all your heart and soul in accordance with everything that I am commanding you today. Not just what the commands we make up or how we think he wants to be pleased, but if we obey him with what he says that day, you and your sons, then Yahuwah, your Elohim, will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahuwah, your Elohim, has scattered you. There's actually another verse I saw somewhere where he says, like, maybe, I, I don't know if it's translator or bias or whatever, that he'll be a gracious Elohim. But I think that that's the same idea with compassion. And so, you know, I, I know I know that Yahuwah is very compassionate. And by the way, the very fact, um, what did, okay, the very fact that we are having this discussion today, I mean, I was just thinking about this today, like, this is an incredible revelation, guys. Like, like they, our controllers have gone out of their way to lie to us about everything right they've destroyed these buildings they've stripped the waterways from the star forts and they've you know they buried things and all these things to erase his story and for 200 years people were deceived and here we're coming along in history and yah is opening up our eyes and we are seeing things that we're just like oh my goodness how was it that two years ago three years ago we did not see any of this stuff and this is Yah's doing, and this is part of his compassion on us. That he's saying, I am, you know, and he's using people, of course, to reveal this to, you know, who don't love him, obviously. Um, but it was like that with the Flat Earth Movement and many other things, 9-11 and other things. But, um, and so I, I see this as a gift from the Most High that he is revealing these things to him. I, I, to us, I am so, you know, gracious um, to yes. it. And his his story is so much more awesome and exciting than any of the dribble that the official narrative pulls out. Like history is so boring compared to what we're talking about. His story, like you know the you know like this is better than any Hollywood plot. How like these satanic powers get together to lie to everybody and to invert everything. And like this is such an awesome story. And here we are learning about it. And so. Um, yeah, so, but going back is, yeah, I, I totally believe that he is, like, if we're coming to him as children, like, he's he's going to be gracious to us, just like uh, a father is to his child. Yeah, he's going to put us over his knee and give us a, a spanking on the butt. Uh, but, th I mean, I hope he does, if he loves us and disciplines us and so on and so forth. But, um, I, uh, you know, that's why he wants us to be children, right? And to come to him to be molded and shaped and to... And to to uh, a child um, believes their parents, right? Like their parents tells them something like, don't cross the street because you may not understand why, but I do. And a child is obedient and say, okay, I'm not going to cross the street because you say so. And perhaps I'll learn why someday. Um, anyways. I'd just like to add to that, that um, it, it is quite astonishing the links that they go through in order to hide the truth from us. I mean, perpetuating that the world is a globe or, you know, just, I, I mean, all of this hiding, taking down these majestic structures, um, you know, manipulating history, you know, indoctrination, all of it. It just, it's funny to me because it probably would have been better if they didn't. <laughs> you know. Well, what do you mean it would have been better if they didn't? Uh, sort of like... Okay, so... Since they hit it, now people want to find the truth, and the truth is getting out more than if they didn't hide it, and people would fall into depravity. Uh and more tempted, I think, than they are now. I don't know. That's sure. just my thoughts on Sure. Sure. Now, you know, yeah, that's a good point. Lee, what do you, what do you all want us to hear? Manipulating history doesn't make every point of it untrue. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but... Um, it's 
it's it's hard because I when I look at history, I you know there's two things to look at, and I don't I guess I don't really totally know what you mean by that, but there there's two things that I look for when I look at, look at history. I look at the exoteric and the esoteric. Last week was a, a perfect example of that because we were talking about uh, Michelangelo and the Medici family and and their fund the Medici family funding of the Jews in Europe as a as a takeover politically. Um, and I tied that in with my study on the wastelands of the seraphim. Uh, but exoterically, um, I can't necessarily say that's really true, that that really happened, because history is a lie. And anything going back to the 1800s starts getting really wonky really fast. Like, I believe World War II happened. I believe World War I happened. I believe the Civil War in some capacity happened, but already we're getting really loose. By the time you get back to, like, the mud flood and stuff, uh, it's like, okay, anything before that, it's like, I don't even know if it happened, right? But on an esoteric level, I think that there's a lot of things that I can look at and go, they are telling us something. Like, you know, they are, the, the our controllers are well-versed in knowing kind of what they're aiming at in, you know, telling us that, you know, what these revolutions and these wars and, you know, things that I'm like really fascinated. I've brought this up a lot. I'm, I'm really interested. I want to look more into like the Spanish conquistadors and the Spaniards coming over and massacring the, the natives of Central America and South America and so on and so forth. Like, what are they telling us there? What, what really happened? Right. Um, um I think what happened, and you see this in this time frame, when you look at um, when they trace the history of slavery somewhat, and they show how it was pretty big um, in Africa, the Middle East, Europe. There was it was part of uh, it was part of the economy. This is part of the labor force. This is was common practice that they 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 tell you. This is you could probably wiki this. And when they show you the numbers, and I'm not trying to make an argument here, when they show you the numbers, much more slaves went South America, Europe from Africa, South America, Europe, and Middle East than went to America, North America. Um, also, more slaves went from Europe to Middle East or North North Africa, Arabs, than went actually from Africa to America. So there was not just slavery between um, so-called blacks and whites. It was pretty much, like I said, part of the economy. It was standard practice between all the peoples, it seemed at this time, of the major trading um, nations that they did this in the wars. They took slaves, and it was big. And what I'm getting at here, hopefully if I remember, is that this narrative that we've been, um, even, like I said, this official one is... They don't pick. They don't paint a good picture even then. It's like even again, even what what somewhat let's say truth they do give us, they then use they twist it, they cover it up, they hide that fact, and then they highlight it over here to again create a divide, a race war, or um, support whatever narrative they're going. So to look back, even what they shared with us. Um, again, when we know what they're mostly, they're mostly lying about all what they've told us to begin with. Yeah, it, that's enough, that, that's pretty much what I was trying to say. If they wouldn't have lied so much about, you know, a lot of things, then it would have been better than lying about all, all these things, right? Like they just leave cookie crumbs everywhere for people to pick up on and then once you you're onto a lie then you see another lie then you see another lie then you see another you know it just keeps going on so 
Katie asked another question, and I'm loving her questions tonight. And she said, are we thinking that the Civil War, 1812 War, were post or pre-Mud Flood? Uh, I'd love to hear if there was a basic timeline laid out. Um, and so I am going back and dusting off um, a lot of a, a lot of my old papers, and I'll be presenting them. I did give a podcast on this, but uh, it really needs to be – I'm going to go back and kind of – a lot of those old podcasts, I'm going to be doing pre presentations like with pictures and more better information. Um, because I kind of wrote them like a script just to read, but I want to show more stuff. The Civil War, definitely post-Mud Flood. 1812, yes, post-Mud Flood. However, um, I think it's very interesting. I've pointed this out many times, and I, have a, I will be giving a presentation on this again, that everybody knows Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, but a lot of people don't know that there was a Napoleon, uh, two Napoleons. Um, it was Napoleon, actually the third, I think it was. Um, there were two Napoleons, and Napoleon Bonaparte did his whole you know, Battle of Waterloo, campaign out to Moscow, so on and so forth. There was a second Napoleon that, and so the first Napoleon happened to coincide with the War of 1812. Well, there was a second Napoleon that just so happened to uh, coincide with the American Civil War. Well, when you compare the two Napoleons, it is freaky how much they have in common uh, to the very dates of like accomplishing the same things, same thing popes were doing, same thing kings around them were doing. And I'll read this off, and it's just mind-boggling how you're actually, it appears like you're actually seeing um, um, that they were actually photoshopping like the same person. Almost think of like Biff in Back to the Future, where you know, like you see him in three different movies, and like the old man, the young man, uh, the middle aged man, the uh, his ancestor, his grandson, and then his uh, like great grandfather or whatever. And but they're all like doing the same thing. They're just Photoshop, same actor playing them. So I have wondered if the um, uh, what was I going to say um, that. The War of 1812 and the American Civil War was the same event. Now, I'm not saying it was, but I highly, I, I question that. I wonder if, like, yeah, they were just the same event, the same Napoleonic event that kind of stretched things out, and that we're not actually removed 200 years from the mud flood, that we might actually be more like 150, 160, I don't know. I don't know, maybe 170 or something, like a little bit less time in between. I don't know. There's just so much that I don't know at this, at this time. Well, I wouldn't call it a Mandela effect. I would just say that it, it's it's just like it's it's f it, like um, who was it that just brought up uh, Anatoly Fominko? And he does a Anatoly Fominko is like a Russian guy. He's got what he calls new chronology, and he's devoted his life to showing how history is photoshopped. And he'll take you through, and he'll like he'll say, okay, now just so you know where I separate ways from Anatoly Fomenko is that I believe the Bible is true. You guys all know that. Um, I'm going to hold that as a, as my source of truth and knowledge because I believe Yahuwah is true and that he is giving us light in the darkness. However, what he'll do is, and this is really interesting, he'll take like the, the Judean line of kings. Okay, He'll show you their birth date, their death, and take you all the way down. And then he'll show the, you the Israeli kings, their birth date, their death, their procreation schedule, all the way down. And then he'll take like the line of popes, and he'll say, and he'll show you, and you're like, oh my goodness, the popes perfectly lined up with like the Judean kings. You're like, well, how can that be possible that their birthdays and their deaths and their procreation schedule is exactly the same as the Judean kings or this line of of Russian czars over here? And what he's basically saying is, look, guys, all they did is they took this formula and they kept replicating this through history. They just photoshopped it. They gave them new names, new titles. Um, you know, these English British kings are all made up. And so you could see that um, in genealogies, where they just made it all up during the Millennial Kingdom. All these people, they're all made up. They're not real. Um, and the reason I still go into genealogies, yeah, I think so. I think they just copied and pasted. Yes. Like, just like Photoshop, right? You're taking a small picture in Photoshop and you're expanding it and making it bigger. Um, and the reason I still go into genealogies, and I talk about this person's related to King Edward the First or the Third, or, or you know, William the Conqueror, or Charlemagne, or the Mayflower, or whatever, is because I, I, I believe that there's something 
esoterically going on here that these people who are all claiming to be related together according to their own genealogies, which I believe they are, I believe they're the sons of Cain, there, there's something in these these lines, even though they're they're made up, um, they're they're, they're, I think that they're truly descended from someone who is special. Like these names are important. That's why I keep bringing up the genealogies. Um, but what they're doing is, is they're basically, uh, excuse me for my offensive words, but they're a bastardly line of kings, right? We know that there was a true king, Messiah, and what they're saying is that they're setting up these false kings that they're the royalty today is descended from, and they're not really descended from those people. If that makes any sense, so. Yeah, that makes sense. It just seems like there was a evil let loose on the world for hundreds, hundreds of years ago, and we see this not just with the mud flood. We see this with, like you were saying, the conquistadors, or over here where these people attack these people. We talked about it the other week, but it was like. And this is where it's framed in this narrative instead of going, look, this was this is a spiritual war. It was a spiritual war back then. Again, Hasatan is using these people or those people to fight those people and to fight them or to conquer them and take over this land and take over this land. And we see and use these people to go over here and take over this land. So we see this happened in all the history we've been shown but we're shown it's this disconnected thing just people conquering other people instead of recognizing i feel that no this has been the enemy's plan that he used all these different people to go and kill conquer destroy whoever because that's his that's what he does that's what he you know he he, he, he as we Say he hates the father. Yeah. So how long, like we saying, we go into, well, we can see in the history. So what they, like I said, what they show us and how much of that can we rely on? We can't. But we know for at least a couple hundred years, 1492, <laughs> Um, so we're looking 1500. So we're looking 500 years if there's been no lie. So this is where some speculated 500 to the year 1500 was maybe the millennial kingdom, or maybe um, we could shift that a little. But what we do see is this short season. And we see that where we notice these beautiful which we recognize as um, the millennial kingdom. Some is Tataria, some is whatever, these old world constructions, that there's been a, um, it's just been destruction. It's just been, a, a, like I said, a, a, a war for that, that we know of everywhere. So it's not like we have a place pretty much anywhere on this earth where it's like, What's your history or where you're from? Oh, it's been peaceful. Oh, yeah, always peaceful. Uh, I don't think we have that example. Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, mention the other thing with um, one thing that I find really interesting with Anatoly Fomenko's work. And one of the ways that I connect with him is that he is really big on. Um, what he he says one thing that is I comp I say is completely true is that the Gregorian calendar is you know a terrible calendar to go off of. Uh, they can just they can just make up dates. They can make up any dates they want. That's why I say the 1812. Like we don't really know that it happened in 1812, the War of 1812. They just they just tell us. It's kind of like I say like 8070. Nobody in 8070 believed it was 8070. Like that that. It's by even calling it 8070, we're giving like permission to the the fact that we're like in the year 2021 right now, right? Um, and what Anat uh, Anatoly Fomenko does is that he uh, he takes 
he says the only accurate clock is the clock in the sky. And we know this is the Oz clock, right? The stars, the, um, I guess you could even say the planets, uh, the stars, but really the sun and the moon. And um, they are accurate. And so what he does is, and I, and I don't really know, I haven't read enough of his work to know how much of his conclusions are legit, but he'll be like, okay, um, the war of Troy, like he'll like take all these different events and try to line up with astro, astro, um, logical signs at the time and say, okay, yeah, this timeline is all wackadoodle. Like you'll be like, okay, uh, Troy really happened in like, uh, like, uh, 1200 AD and, uh, you know, like, you know, even though it was supposed to happen in like what, like 2000 BC or something like that. Um, and he just moves all the events around. It's, it's pretty mind boggling, um, how they just, they rewrote history in the way they did. So, um, I want to point out to, uh, exceeding abundantly, um, he's been sharing a lot of photos, uh, the construction supposedly of Chicago. Now I want to point out that all the world fairs, you can find construction photos. Um, you can find some blueprints, not a lot. Um, you can find many of the photos we have all across the realm of supposed capital buildings, um, uh, train depots, all sorts of things that appear to be very old. Uh, there are many times there are construction photos. And I'm, I'm in, John Levy actually, uh, put it really well recently. He was showing construction photos of a. I came out of a video two or three weeks ago showing construction photos of the a terminal building, and and he basically said like, I don't accept this narrative at all. Um, I I I guess what I need to do is as I advance this series on the um, the world fairs is that I need to address some of the construction photos more, just like I did addressed. Uh, and I'm not prepared right now to address it, but. Um, I do thank you for bringing those up. Um, like I, I showed like the, the fake photos of them destroying it. They were fake photos, right? And there's a lot of anomalies people are pointing out with these construction photos. Um, some people, um, you know, feel like, ask questions like, are they really being, you know, destroyed? What, what's really going on with these construction photos? Are they faked? All sorts of things. So, um, but I, I'm just in the boat where I, I do not believe in any way, they have not been able to demonstrate to me. A good way to put it is like um, NASA going to the moon, right? I mean, they, they can show us how the 10 years of preparation and all the different shuttles they went through and all the astronauts training and preparing and, you know, all the things they did to get to the moon. But I do not accept that narrative. I do not accept the narrative that we landed on the moon. That's how I feel with these world fairs. I don't accept the narrative at all, that they were constructed in the time, in two years' time, uh, with the materials they said they, you know, constructed them with. And the amount of, like, if you look at, like, uh, Disney theme parks, like, Epcot is not as grand of a theme park as the Chicago World Fair. With all the budget and, and decades it took to plan that thing out and build it. And I just, I, I don't accept it at all, that these these dudes sitting up at the the... Uh, Rand McNally office building up there were able to sketch out all these plans and like the amount of how intricate all these buildings are for them to actually put all that together is just unbelievable. So that's my only response at this time. But as I progress further, because that was one of the first things that when I started looking into the World Fairs uh, two years ago, my first thought process was, I want to see the construction photos. So I started look, hunting them down and looking at them. Um, the San Francisco construction photos, the, the, the Chicago, but also the Buffalo, and, and you know, trying to figure that out. So what's the, James, what's the, um, the oh, the... Old World Hub. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the video, right? He came out with it a couple of weeks ago, seven minutes in. Yeah, where he shows the construction photos and he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't accept this. And I don't, I don't accept it. I think that they lied to us about all of this. And, and they, they have to, I mean, they have to make it. Now, keep in mind that I think, I think that they, obviously, like, there was, um, I was, my wife, uh, Sarah and I were watching a video last night on, um, all the cathedrals around the world and how they're these like microwave emitters and stuff. And like, they're just incredible. Like this idea that they were actually batteries and he was showing where 
um, they were showing how conveniently all across the earth in all these cathedrals, uh, these domed or whatever buildings, they have like these, uh, like, like, are they pentagonal or maybe octagonal shaped? They're like all the same shaped uh, structures that they call baptismals. And they say that they were all built as baptismals, but they're like, like, no, like this was, these were actually, uh, that's where like the machine went, which is like crazy to think about. What my point was with that is looking at the insane amount of deconstruction and reconstruction they did to try to um, to hide this and cover it up and make it look like to the American public that they were introducing these buildings uh, when they said they did. And this is one of the reasons I actually brought up that at the beginning that there's there's a reason why neoclassical buildings uh, they all say that they were built in the 17 1800s there's a reason why they stopped making neoclassical buildings it's because there were no more neoclassical buildings to assign to architects because they'd already been built if that makes any sense to anyone so um anyways well you know they've already kind of reset our our world a couple times since then if we think about it, like during the 20s, 1920s, the roaring 20s, and then depression, war, you know, it's like um, we're dumbed down nation again. And then the 50s and the 60s, it's like you can go back into the times again, the, this, um, and just in America. Um, I'm reminded of where I'm from in New England, they had, and I know two places in particular, and there was more. And like in this lake, this pond, they had these grand buildings out on the water where people used to come. And there was, they had these, and they were all connected by um, um, railroads or um, street uh, um, elect electric cars going all up there. And this is in New England. They destroyed all of that. All of that is gone, and it, and it's almost like it was primitive back then. It was primitive and hard shackle, and it was like, oh, wait a second. Now, what about this stuff? So here it was once again. This technology has been there. This, this um, civilization has kept rising and falling, rising and falling. You can look at it in just the last 20 years. Um, it's really been uh, controlled, and every time it seems yeah. it, it um, gets up, boom! They read, they they pull the rug out. Like it's great times now. Here we go. Nope, world is you know nope. Can't have this um, virus. Um, the um, in, inflation. We got to reset this because you know it's like guys who again. Sorry if I'm insulting, but don't buy this narrative. That, that whatever in the financial, this is all controlled, scripted, has no sound reason. It's made up. Whatever you're being shown, made up. Why? They they do this because once again, people their lie is falling apart again. So they got to dumb us down again. How do they do it? Rewrite the script, reset it. So panic and fear once again. And you can see it. We're living in the age of idiocracy again. So how did we just end up in, weren't we? But people pretend they're knowledgeable, but idiocracy land. So we're seeing this again. And this is the, this has been the, that plan all along. And we're fed different narratives, like for the reasons why. Instead of the reason why is he's trying to, destroy us and every time yeah as we're we're yas people we we get keep getting uplifted he reveals the truth to us this happens again and i'm like wow it's really happening right now again and like you expressed earlier and i expressed earlier i'm feeling good about it because this is this is yahuwah this is yahuwah is doing ultimately what he's showing us and giving us the wisdom the true wisdom to see it. And if we're, if we're really looking at wisdom, we're not buying into the fear narrative. Even if we're looking at, you know, evil. 
So, right. So I want to go back to the construction photos real quick too. Um, like if you were to do, um, if anyone were to do research on the construction of the railroads, okay, the, uh, the transatlantic, uh, you know, to Pacific railroads, you're going to find a lot of construction photos. All right, you're going to find a lot of pictures of like Chinamen out there with their shovels, you know, like maybe holding a stick of dynamite or, or whatever, right? And they're they're going to try to sell you, and they had to sell the American public on the fact that they were built. When my conclusions at, at this point is that I believe that they were uh, a system that was set up during the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, they were already in place, and I don't accept that a narrative that the trains were built. Another one is the uh, the one that blows all of this out of the water is the Erie Canal. If anyone has done research on the Erie Canal, uh, I need to present that one week because it is so mind numbing. The official narrative of how they were apparently these labor. And there's tons of photos you can go right now and look. Uh, Erie Canal construction photos. You're going to find a lot. They were out there documenting the construction of the Erie Canal, and I don't buy that narrative. I don't believe that these dudes, before they had dynamite, they had they were able to cut through clear rock and engineer this thing in a few short years. Like they were going like a mile or something per day or something. Like out like outrageous. Um, there's just no no way, no freaking way um, that you know they were able to go out there and do this. And um, so that shows that even with the construction. Uh, photo uh, the the construction f it, it, it's you see this a lot in these narratives like with the atomic bomb uh, one of the things i really as i started looking into the atomic bombs and i i don't know what kind of big bombs they have now they have some big bombs now right I, i'm not really concerned about them i don't believe the nuclear um uh the whole storyline with kim jong oh no i hope kim jong un doesn't get a nuclear bomb every other but everybody else has a nuclear bomb you know like india got the bomb they figured it out you know uh right india and pakistan yeah, i was yeah. laughing oh yeah Oh yeah, Pakistan. Ooh, yeah, they, they all they all figured it out. But Kim Jong Un isn't in the know. Apparently, you know, he's just in it. He's just like Kim Jong Un is like a like a CIA movie set. Like that's just it's like a like every time I see Kim Jong Un, I'm like that's an MTV music video. You know, it's just like a total movie set. But anyways, um, one thing I found when I was reaching, researching the atomic bomb hoax was that just like NASA going to the moon, it's all in the construction. Like they put a huge emphasis on the development of the bomb, and of course, you start looking at it. In my opinion, it falls apart. Uh, it's just it's it's totally ridiculous uh, the entire narrative. But they put a lot, and they show people out there in the field you know, testing, guy, and they're like, "What's swimming in the water?" One guy holding it in his hands. Yeah, um, yeah. They they show you all these photos of the dudes out there testing the bomb with their glasses on, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, hoax, 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 hoax. And so this is where they always get you. They try to show you these photos, but the the narrative itself, you know, because people are like, it's the same thing of like, but don't they have satellites of Earth from space? It's like, no, those are those are faked. Those are faked photos. Um, yeah, it's kind of like those those nuclear blasts. You see them go off, but the camera is just sitting there still. Recording it all. <laughs> Everything else is blown to bits, but the camera somehow survived. <laughs> Somebody was saying this positive. I don't know if it was the space station. It wasn't a satellite. It was the space station. One of those guys up there going, it's not the space station. We know that's a fake. But whatever that thing is that's up there, we don't know what that is. It's sunlight, and it is going around. What could that be? <laughs> Um, my speculation on it is, is a hologram, a 3D, uh, what do you call that? 3D projecting? Could be wrong. I'm just guessing. You, you mean like Project Bluebeam or something? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, I remember that, um, um, yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever is up there, uh, is appears to be the shape of what they say is the ISS. Um, you know, the guy who designed the, man, I need to find that quote, the guy who designed the ISS, because, you know, like he, he apparently, uh, the guy who designed it totally believes the narrative, you know, totally legit. And, you know, it, it, anyone who's been in that, um, 
there's just so much compartmentalization, of course, right, too, um, obviously. Just like with the atomic bomb and all that kind of stuff. Nobody knew what they were working on. Apparently, they all believed the narrative, but they, nobody knew. Well, the guy who designed the ISS, or one of the designers, he's come out and criticized it, saying, like, it's just a piece of junk. He's like, like what What were they trying to do with it? Like, there was, there was nothing scientific about it. Like, there was... And it, so... I, I, I don't know what the ISS is. I, I, I haven't looked into it like some of you guys have. I again I don't I've seen it. I've seen um I've seen the ISS go over many times. You know, I've stood out there and watched it. Something's going overhead. I don't know what it is. I don't accept the narrative. I don't know what it is. I've seen videos of where it just disappears and then it reappears again. So I don't know. That wouldn't surprise me in the least. And here's something that just gets like, I guess they don't talk about it much because so many people would go, are you for real? China's on the moon. <laughs> Supposedly the dark side of the moon at that. Yeah. Um, They're all on the dark like, side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, guys, uh, really now? Well, they're on Mars too, right? Oh my word. It's like, and then you see the video and you see the stuff. I'm like, okay. Um, it kind of goes to like, this is where's we're, we're, <laughs> we're so conditioned that <laughs> we've been so conditioned that you could show something and say whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah i'd like to bring this up too uh patrick says i went to an adobe convention a few years ago the way they can manipulate images in photoshop using ai these days is mind-blowing and i think it was lee that shared a, a video in one of these channels the other day of an an animation but if you didn't have a trained eye to see the animation it would completely fool you um, as the actors looked real. Um, but, and even the animation on everything else looked pretty real. Um, so their fakery is getting very good and uh, it can deceive people pretty easily if you, if you don't look for it. So, it's actually troubling how many, like we, we look at these old fo photographs and many from the 1800s and we think that they're like being totally honest, like they're, you know, documentarians and, you know, they're just going around documenting the Civil War and that kind of stuff. And it's actually disturbing how many times they went out of their way to lie to us. Like if you do, um, uh, you know, obviously the, the older, you know, editing was clearly not up to par like it is now. Um, like we, like we see with, um, you know, like I showed you those ridiculous hoax photos of the fire. Um, but <clears throat> you know, you see like a lot of photographs in the civil war and other times where one of the famous ones in my own, I couldn't believe it when I actually saw it. I could not believe it. Cause I've seen this photo so many times. I never thought to look at the sky or study it, but it's the famous one of the, um, the like the confederates uh sitting in my hometown city of charleston like they're sitting around in the wreckage and if you look at the sky somebody took the time with scissors to cut out the entire skyline like go over the trees and it's like what why would they do that why would they cut out the sky and put in a fake sky and you see this time and again with a lot of the civil war photos and it's just weird and so clearly somebody was going out of their way to transform uh, these photos and hide things in them and change them around um and then you know sell them as as the real deal um you know that's just it i i've seen enough problems and anomalies within civil war photos to to finally really throw the whole thing in question that like clearly that there was you know it was one big like freemasonic uh, convention going down um you know, on both sides. I, I I don't even know what was, I don't even know what the civil war was doing anymore. I've seen so many anomalies and photos. Uh, one of the people in our group here, Sharon, she wrote a really great uh, article for 
uh, stolen history in which she showed uh, the because she used to live in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I've been to Fredericksburg. I've seen the battlefield, uh, you know, myself or what they say is the battlefield, and it's 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 really bizarre that in all the photos it, it that Matthew Brady is going around photographing, it appears as though whatever was going on in Fredericksburg is they were like. Uh, they were cleaning up something that happened. It was like a cleanup crew. You see the famous photo of Abraham Lincoln surrounded by his two uh, secret servicemen, and they both have their you know hands in their sleeve, like you know, like a couple of clowns. Um, you know, they're g- giving us the pose or telling us that you know what is happening here is is an you know an illusion. And and there's only one photo of. All of Fredericksburg have ever seen Confederates, and Matthew Brady took it, the big hoaxer. And he's taking pictures of these supposed Confederates who are posing for him across the river on these train tracks. And it's like, I I just, I I don't accept that anymore. I I don't accept the narrative that they're selling us. You know, all these photographs that they're, they're, they're going out of their way to convince us of something that never happened to begin with. That's how deep this really goes, and how it's just unbelievable. Yeah, this deception. Um, it, it's just it's unbelievable, and that's why I, I really think we're onto something with the Molino Kingdom. This is the biggest cover up in history. I am convinced now that Globe Earth. Oh yeah, there's the photo, James. Yeah, of the only photo of Confederates in Fredericksburg, and you see that they put a fake cannon in the window there. That's a fake cannon. How did they even get that cannon up into the room, like a, a real size cannon? It's a fake cannon. They did it for the photo. It's not real. Um, and, yeah, so it, it's just the links they went to, to to lie to us in history. I am convinced the globe Earth uh, really was. Um, uh, maybe, maybe people started developing globe Earth before the um, the Millennial Kingdom. Maybe some of that's legitimate and they kind of picked up where they left off. But I'm just convinced all of it was just created the, the, the biggest cover up. Like this is where uh, Globe uh, Flat Earth is leading us. It's to the fact that the the, the, the biggest cover up in history. It's the Millennial Kingdom that it happened. Um, so <laughs> that's that's funny. Patrick said the Globe is the original lie of the globalist. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. That's spot on. And I'm I'm curious too because uh, Patrick had brought up, um, I you know I don't want to like get into the Mandela effect tonight. You know I I might give a presentation on it. I'm, I am kind of gearing up because you know CERN is is uh, getting ready to open back up, and I think we're going to see some psychotic things happening. Uh, with their bigger, more improved collider, um, um, uh, hydron collider, or whatever. But I, I'm I'm actually suspicious that a lot of these photos that are popping up too. Um, I don't want to just like move the goalie post, but like there's a lot of photos that are kind of popping up that like I don't I don't know if they ever existed before, if they're like new or not. But sometimes I wonder if they're like, you know, they're just coming up with historical photos now like we're gonna just start like seeing more and more things that are like wait what like i've never seen that before you know there's like yeah, no way to, there's no, easy, easy to do yeah and there's just no way to prove it it's like okay yeah you found this in some uh, uh photo book in a library in uh the middle of idaho and okay you know like it's just there's no way to prove it right and i i, I suspect yeah. they do that a lot Well, guys, it's getting uh, about that time. This has been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed this tonight. This was really. Uh, this has probably been my favorite discussion in a long time. Yeah, just um, back to what you said earlier, Noel, about the Millennial Kingdom and why. It's because, okay, deny Yahusha now, people. When you when we realize he was here, because that's what goes with this, the Millennial Kingdom. It's like. Because again, it's about our relationship with Yahuwah and his family. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, guys, this has been uh, great tonight. Um, just so everybody knows, because uh, I've been taking my 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 sons on uh, kind of a field trip 
every single week and been kind of showing him different things. We went to see a star for, of course, I took him to the zoo last week, but this weekend on this Sunday, I am taking them. We're actually, I'm going to be showing my sons tomorrow night uh, the Truman Show. We're going to be watching that movie and I'm going to be. Uh, kind of, you know, my my wife and I were kind of gearing up. We're talking to them about it, about how you know it, we're all kind of in this movie set, and there's these actors around us that are trying to convince us of something that isn't true. And we're going to sh- uh, watch the the Truman Show. But the great thing is, is that we're actually just down the street from the actual uh, town where they filmed the Truman Show. It's called Seaside, and it's it's literally like a little paradise. It's the most beautiful little. All right. Uh, movie set city you've ever been to, and uh, and so we're going to take them there to like all the scenes from the movie, um, where you know the actual house where he lived and the post office and the grocery store and all that kind of stuff. And we go there all the time. We go there every single year, but I've never talked to them about it. Um, this is in Florida. Yeah, it's it's right. It's called Seaside. It's uh, so funny you bring this up because I was going to say ask you uh, um, bring this to the conversation earlier. Um, how many people do you think are walking around? Because I live on a small island. Ain't many people to begin with. But how many people you think are walking around are NPCs or actors? Like, and where it's even more like, and then you bring up the Truman Show. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that unfortunately, there's way more actors than anybody cares to admit. Um, and you know, that, that, that brings up some delicate points. Um, you know, I, I really do believe that obviously I am completely sold on this, that, that the children of Cain still exist and that they're the people running the world. Um, and I don't know how many of the, of these children of Cain know that, or they, they really believe that the, you know, the capitalist story that they just so happened to, you know, make it to the big time, like Elvis Presley, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, obviously behind the scenes, they were selected and that kind of stuff. I don't know. I don't know where the conspiracy begins and ends. Um, but, you know, I mean, the unfortunate thing, and this has been discussed a lot, uh, I'll go ahead and say this. There, there's, when, when Rob Skiba died, there was a a big, I, I said at that time there was, I felt like there was some sort of signpost or a paradigm shift. And um, since, since he's died, what I have noticed is that there is a shell fest going on. Like people are all accusing other people of being shells. This person's a shell, that person's a shell, you know, and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. But while I, um, while I do believe that shells surround us i'm not concerned about that because uh, i'm really not like it, it's it, there's it, it, say, if satan is doing his job right then he's got boots on the ground and and, and that's that's going to be one of those things i think it's it's kind of like i said that um years ago i started saying that when the mark of the beast is rolled out that we're all going to be shocked to learn you know who's taking it who's not who's saying that it is the mark and who it isn't and that's what we see today with a lot of ministries are like oh no it's not the it's not the mark i've got too many friends that are taking it maybe they themselves have taken it i don't know but um it's the same thing i think that one day we're going to be shocked to learn uh i almost want i almost have this idea that when i'm hauled off to a fema camp that um that like like I'm going to get like a card, like someone's going to hand me a card. I'm going to flip it over. It's going to have like somebody's name on it who turned me in. Like who was like, 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 ha ha, like somebody I know really well, like someone who I trusted in my life. But, um, I'm not really concerned about that because it's, it's, there's nothing I can do about that. Right. And I know what the truth is. Like, I know what the truth is. The truth is who is giving us his word and his testimony of who he is. And, and as long as I go home, and as Zach Bauer always says, just go home and read your Bible. Like th- that's that's all you, you guys need to do. Just d- don't trust. You don't need to worry about any of us. Just go home and read your Bible. And um, it just is what it is. So, um, wait, wait. What was the question? Uh, what does that mean? What is a shell? Did I spell that right? A, a, a shell is someone who is. Yeah, they're like they're working for they're pick, they're paid to control the narrative. They're coming in and you know, again though, like one of the things like when I when I write my my 
papers and I'm looking at this stuff, I can look at big names and I can go, okay, like, you know, Jim Jones, I believe he was an actor. Charles Manson, I believe he was an actor. And I can go and look at these guys and go, okay, I see what their agenda is. I see why they were doing what they did and how they led people down a certain path. Um, I'm very skeptical of when people out someone as a shill and they're trying to teach people like the Bible and they've got like a YouTube channel and they're like, you know, they've got so many followers. It's like, okay, just because they have a different view than you doesn't make them a shell. Like, that's, like, let's just be honest here. Like, we all have different views. We're all going to disagree on things. Uh, let's not, you know, make this a personality or a pride issue. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that there are a lot of people out there, I believe, that are um, um, leading people astray. Let me, let me also comment, though, on this, that my understanding of a spook, okay, is that, or a shell, or whatever, is that the media, the media doesn't really care if, if truthers know somebody is an actor or not. They don't really care about that. Like, they, they don't really, like, they're, they're, it's not about trying to convince us of whether or not they're an actor. Like, They've already convinced the whole world that the world is organic and that they need to fear North Korea and, you know, Iran and, you know, all these different, you know, blah, 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 and China and Russia and all these different things, like, and all these different people are organic and these actors and they rose to the ring. Like, people are all convinced of that. They don't really care if, um, if we out them or not, if that makes any sense. Um, so, you know, sometimes you'll see, uh, YouTubers or something like that. Um, I won't give any names, but they're like the ones that are in the media all the time that the media turns to. And you're kind of like, yeah, okay, that's that's interesting right there. Alex, Alex Jones is a really good example. He's kind of like low hanging fruit, uh, as you um, as you dropped his name, Deborah. Yeah, yeah, Alex Jones. You know, I I do believe he's Bill Hicks, and I do believe that he is a shill and that he is put in place. Um, to help control the narrative. Now, in his case, I can see where the narrative is being controlled because he's got a lot of people. He he still is keeping people grounded in this worship of the state. You know, the state that the country itself is God. The the Constitution, the Declaration, you know, seventeen seventy six. That is our God, and we're going to you know defend that. You know, and he's big on you know the whole QAnon crowd and all that kind of stuff. So. A lot of people now, you know, a lot of us will say I was one of them. When I woke up, I came like Infowars was my first go to. It was like the baby steps. It's where I ended up, and I came out of it pretty quickly. I was in there like six months, and I was out of there, and I saw there was something very wrong with it, and I kept advancing through the, you know, through knowledge. But a lot of people they get stuck in that rut and they can't get out of it, and that's kind of the the, the intent to kind of keep them in this this illusion of you know of. Uh, yeah, it's just illusion of choice almost. Um, I don't know how really else to explain it. Yeah, so. I've been watching Info Infowars for a very long time. Um, well, ever since before it was even broadcast, it was on the radio. You know, Alex was on radio, and back then you could see that. I mean. You know, he was exposing stuff, and he does expose stuff every once in a while, but at the same time, he controls the narrative, like like you're saying, like he's a shill, because he won't touch on certain s subjects like the Jesuits, uh, he won't touch on like, um, well, like f Flat Earth or Fake Space or... Um, you know, and he, he tries to keep you on the political side of things and you, the whole production is about politics right you know who's going to be running in politics and and also on that point of being a shill you know i would like to point out that joe rogan was all about space being fake and nasa lies and everything before he started to be um i guess it was before his youtube career really started and then he he pulled back and he said oh if you don't believe that the space landings weren't real then then th i would suggest looking into it more because it absolutely they landed on the moon and everything and you know so he just totally did a 180 <laughs> that's and, that's 
that's yeah. that's very hard to believe that anyone would like that any of us could go I think I was wrong. I think they really did land on the moon. Like that's just hard for me to believe. But okay, like here's a sombering thought with Alex Jones, okay? You could look up the record book on this. Who was the first person out there telling everybody that 9/11 was a false flag attack? It was Alex Jones. He, I think it was at least on September 12th. It might have been on September 11th. He came out with a video. But I, I just saw it recently. Like I think it was stamped September 12th. And he's out there saying it was our own government did this. This was a false flag attack. Alex Jones, who is a show. I, mean, I think everyone here probably, I mean, any like like serious truther that I know, uh, like, be like, yeah, he's a, he's a shell, right? But he was the first that I know of, that right. I have seen, that rolled it out, that it's a false flag attack. Okay, so we all, that's a sombering thought, and everybody needs to really think about this, that, you know, we, we go shell, 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 but they're actually used by the government to feed us truth. They These shells actually do feed us intel. That's just the reality. Um, and um, it was... Um, Oh, I forget his name. He wrote the quintessential book on on psychodrama and nine eleven. Michael, uh, ah, can't think of his name. Hoff, Hoffman, Michael Hoffman, I think it is. He talks about this and he shows the actual uh, documents and stuff like uh, like like British intel, and they they say that that's exactly what they do. That they actually leak, you know, they they use, but they don't use the word truther, but you could say the same that they use us as their pawns. And they leak information to us, and we disseminate it into um, the crowds. And we're like, we're exposing the government. The government's the ones telling us. Why do we believe that satanic sacrifice is a thing? Because Intel has been telling us that for decades. Why do we believe pedophilia is a thing? Because Intel has been telling us that. They're the ones leaking this. They're the ones that leaked Flat Earth to us. I believe they're the ones leaking Tartaria to us and all this. I believe all of this is coming by Intel. Um, and that's just the reality of the situation. And so, um, th sometimes when I, um, say that, like, uh, th there's a very famous, um, uh, person out there that we all talk about, uh, that is uh, giving a lot of really fascinating information about, um, the old world right now. And I believe, I, I think he's, I think he's, uh, um, he's working for Intel and I don't, I don't. And so, on one hand, it's kind of that's kind of like the world of espionage. Like I, I, I think he's actually leaking this information to us, um, and it's just reality. So, just to always keep that in mind when we talk about shills and that kind of stuff, that it's like we accuse them of being a shell, but it's like, well, what what did they leak to us? What did they tell us that was that we are running with this information and telling others about it? Right. Well, that's a good question, Katie. Why are they leaking this info? There's a, quite a few um, reasons, but um, w there's a phrase to this, and I can't think about it right now, that it's like a, a accountability, um, and someone else can think about what it is. Um, ah, I can't think about it. But a lot of it, too, is their, um, the, the way psychodrama works uh, is is that when we look at a lot of fake imagery and stuff, the, uh, I, I think that a lot of that is purposeful. A lot of truthers and stuff, they'll say, oh, that's them, you know, NASA's slipping up. Like, you know when they, in, was it 2012, when they gave the, the blue marble with the gigantic North America? And everyone's like, oh, they slipped up. It's like, no, NASA didn't slip up. They didn't slip past the secretary, and they didn't do that right. Like, they're, you know, it's a, it's the very reason why, and I don't care what anyone says. Like, guys, Sandy Hook, because Alex Jones, this is, by the way, part of his agent's role that he's getting hammered right now for Sandy Hook. And everyone's like, oh, he lied to us about Sandy Hook. Did it really happen? No, Sandy Hook did not happen. It did not happen. And and Alex Jones ruled, he was instrumental in that. He was the one pointing out that it didn't happen. And now he's being like sued or whatever and whatever and all these things. And, and he's, I guess, making truthers look bad and all that kind of stuff. But like they rolled out the Sandy Hook choir with the same children who were murdered. They brought them out into the Super Bowl, guys. That was not an accident. 
Why would they do that for cog- reasons of cognitive dissonance to let it seep further in? You know, you push these uncomfortable feelings down. You, you know, you make the, the wickedness and the evil seep for, you know, uh, f- you know, fill your veins basically. And so I think that's a lot of that, that as we actually are going out there, like they don't care about the foot soldiers. That's what we are. We're foot soldiers. They don't care about us. They don't care if there's so many woken people. We're easily dealt with uh, they can you know shut off the valve at any time they want to like they did with a lot of the flatter talk but um a lot of ways when we're actually going and showing this stuff to people um i think that we're we're almost helping them with the predictive programming we're actually working for them in a way and we're um helping helping people choose the wickedness like as we show them this information and they reject it you know, we're actually, you see how we're kind of doing their bidding, like they're, they're hardening their hearts. And I think there's really something to it about not casting pearls before swine. Um, you know, that we really like, I, I, I don't, that's one of the, the sad things about my website and stuff is I, I can't control who that goes out to. I, all that information. I don't engage people unless if I really feel that they are, are ready to receive, you know, you know, it's almost like Morpheus, like seeking out Neo, right? Like you don't just give anybody the red pill. Like you, you're seeking out the right person. Um, but anyways, um, it's, it's complex, but yeah, that just goes back. I, I, a lot of this information that we're passing around to accuse the government of things and expose the government was given to us by the very government we're exposing. It's just the way it works. So, yeah. And on that point about, you don't give everybody the red pill, you know, a lot of people can't handle the red pill. You know, I try to wake up one guy and I told him about these things. You know, he asked a question or two and he would push back, especially about flat earth, but he went back to taking the blue pill. You know, he didn't, he didn't want the red pill. (laughs) Um, And then also on, on that, there's some people that can't handle it and they actually go off the deep end. <laughs> so you need to be cautious of who you give that red pill to. <laughs> I had to battle a lot of indoctrination guys, like tons. And I know we all have, I mean, I've really had to work through a lot to get where I'm at. And I'll see some people like they, they, they're like, I'll, I'll meet them online and they're like, yeah, I just heard about like conspiracy theories. Like, 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 like a month ago and I'm all fresh to this. This is amazing. And then like, you know, I check up on them like, like six months later and they're just like, like deep into this stuff. I'm like, I'm like, dang, that was, <laughs> that was a fast transition. Now they're like, you know, going around and they're like, you know, schooling other people on this stuff. I'm like, man, they just went from like believing nine 11 was legit. And then we landed on the moons all of a sudden they're like, at almost like a, my like knowledge or something like that. It's incredible how fast some people will um, delve into it. How receptive, uh, receptive well, some people are. Y- yeah, especially nowadays, you know, when knowledge is expanding. And, I, you know, just within the past few days, I've seen a lot of people join this server. So, I, I think there's, you know, this, what they call a great awakening happen. Uh, where people are seeking the truth more uh, because they see all the lies. Yeah. Yeah. And and I also want to go back to what Katie was asking about and, and, you know, where Satan comes into this. And I've said this before time and again, but I'm really, I feel like truly beginning to really understand the true knowledge of evil, but also how Satan operates. And the thing is, is that Satan has to give us the truth or else if he doesn't give us the truth, he can't accuse us. And this is one of the big arguments I give as to why I believe that he, he, he can lie to us about everything, but he wants us to have the truth of the law of Yahuwah's ways, just so that he can lie to us about it or hold us accountable for rejecting it or you know or uh, being diso- you know being disobedient to it. And and it's the same thing with you know he will uh, roll out his own lies to us um, in order for people to choose the lie, right? To give their to give their permission to be lied to. It's kind of like anytime you do watch a movie right like you know that those are actors and you're giving your permission to be lied to by those actors right and um and that's that's just the thing about all the stuff we're talking about um i love that you just went to uh millie vanelli and um 
Yeah, uh, and on the fact that you're talking about actors, <laughs> that worked out good. I, I'm still trying to figure out if the Milli Vanilli thing uh, was actually a real slip up, or that they were actually drawing it out because. I have this idea for a paper I've been wanting to write for a couple of years now called The Ice Man Cometh, and it's about vanilla ice. And the reason, like, I know the only reason that stopped me from writing this is because nobody is, cares to read about vanilla ice, but vanilla ice is a fascinating story because he was clearly a script from day one. Like, when he went on Arsenio Hall, and Arsenio Hall is the guy that dropped the story about, you know, how fake he was, and, like, and, you know, they started making the SNL and the In Living Color skits about him right away and stuff. He was almost like, Intel was, like, just, like, what, what's a, it's getting late, and I can't think as well now, but it was almost like they were mocking the the whole American dream and, and greed and, and making a, you know, a case out of this. And Man uh, Man uh, Man I can't even think now, but uh, Melly Vanelli were out at the same time. Like they were kind of, you know, uh, Vanilla Ice's rise and downfall within like a very short six month to a year period as very quickly he came and went. And, you know, they basically got everyone to love him and then turn against him really quickly. And it was all scripted out. And I've, I, I've just like, I was one day just watching Arsenio Hall clips and I'm like, like people back then actually thought these shows were legit and that uh, that they weren't staged. They were so staged; it was so bad. Anyways, so yeah, with the Amelia uh, Vanilli, like when the, that famous, if you guys can all remember, like when they were trying to perform live, and then everybody apparently thought they were really singing, but then it like started skipping the song, and it and and it hit the news everywhere. And I kind of think that that was kind of think it was purposeful, but I don't really know. Yeah, I um Katie, I um I I will write anything that I think people will read. For an example, I, I did this story on Monica Lewinsky. Um I wrote that like last January or February and showing the Tanya Harding uh when Tanya Harding went and clubbed her and I, I just showed how ridiculous the entire narrative is and that there was not a single bruise on her leg. Just show me the bruise, right? Like she performed uh, within like a month afterwards, Nancy, uh, Nancy Kerrigan, she came back and performed, showing off her legs. There is no bruise on her leg for something that she got clubbed like right next to the kneecap. It was and it the whole thing like the the camera set up like I was looking at the footage and how Monica Lewinsky starts screaming in the hallway and the camera follows it in and the and the doctors are like, "Where's where does it hurt?" And she's like, "Ah," you know that kind of stuff. And but anyways, I wrote that story and. I got some really interesting reception from that because I was getting women who were writing me about this going, because they, you know, they, they're just nostalgic and they're looking up Google, uh, latest on Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. They wanted to relive that incident that they remembered in like 1992 or 93. And um, I mean, I remember when it happened. I remember when it was in the news and I remember uh, being glued to that whole psychodrama. And, and they were just, I was getting people, uh, women writing me going, this is really interesting. I never realized this. And I was like, it was like, that's cool. Like there was, there was something that started waking up these people to this greater world out there that they had never thought about. So I would, you know, totally write something on Vanilla Ice if it, if I thought there would be, you know, people out there just nostalgic for Vanilla Ice and look into it and go, what? You know what I'm saying? Like, this was all a script. You know, they just never thought about that before. So, yeah. Anyway, I would read it. Ice Ice, baby. Ice, I would ice, totally baby. read that. And I thought it was hilarious that you said Monica Lewinsky twice. I was just picturing Monica Lewinsky being clubbed in the knee by some, some guy that Tanya Harding hired. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering if um, there's got to be something um, with the word with the name ice, right? Because there's ice, vanilla ice, and ice cube, and ice tea, and you know why are why what's with the ice thing? For immigration and ice for crystal meth and. Yeah, I I had there joked, is something to it. I'm sure. I had joked. I have joked in the past that you know I I tried out as a rapper and my name was Ice Cappuccino. It never really worked out, but <laughs> or I'd be van, I'd be vanilla latte. <laughs> uh, 
That's funny. All right, guys. Well, it is midnight here on Central Time. Uh, it's probably one o'clock on the East Coast. Um, so I am going to be the referee and call it right now. But I have to say that I actually really enjoyed just, a, I think it's been two hours since I gave my presentation. We've been talking for two hours. Um, I really enjoyed this tonight. It's been one of my favorite talks that we've probably ever had. And this has been great. I feel a lot of energy in the room. And um, so we'll do this again next week. Y'all willing, I will be talking on the, the 70 AD timeline, which is kind of like, like if you guys remember the Thornbirds um, that came out with like Richard Chamberlain in the 80s. I remember that because my mom loved Richard Chamberlain and Thornbirds. Uh, but then like in the 90s, they came out with the Thornbirds, the missing years, you know, which took place in the, the the time jump so the 70 80 paper next week will be kind of uh because if you guys remember when i did the 7000 year timeline deception i totally skipped over 70 AD. uh and so this will be like the 7000 year timeline deception the missing years it'll be 70 AD, and i'll be kind of working on that y'all willing i'll have it ready and um it's not going to be as intensive as this week that this like it did me in this week uh getting the, that all done and i had a lot of slip ups and other things in there but it is what it is anyways i enjoyed this so shalom everybody and i will see you guys around good night, night. everybody